What's up, party people, and welcome to Countdown to Classic. This is a podcast that educates, informs, and gossips about the highly anticipated World of Warcraft Classic. Each week, we discuss the news, hot button issues, and content of the highly anticipated Classic servers. I'm your host, Josh Corbett, and this is a show where it's not my opinion on World of Warcraft that counts, but yours. If you're new to the show, Countdown to Classic goes through your expert input on everything relating to the upcoming release of World of Warcraft Classic. Today, we've got a bunch of great calls and conversations for you, but some quick housekeeping first, as we've got some Alliance speed leveling guides to give away, courtesy of the amazing Alenya and Umbra, who were on the show recently about their plans to shoot for World First to 60, and the intricate guide that they've developed over the past two years to help assist with that. As you heard on the show, Alenya and Umbra were kind enough to offer five of these bad boys to give away to countdown listeners and so congratulations to the following entries that made me laugh jacoby matrasaur binger 81 lock and slummon Congrats to you all, Alenia or I will be in touch soon. Also, big news everyone, and I feel the need to bring this up beforehand so it doesn't sound too weird when it happens. Countdown to Classic has grown big enough that we now automatically qualify for advertisers through my podcast hosting service. They set some pretty lofty goals for this, and it's a huge achievement to get there, but I'm hoping some ads read out by myself perhaps twice through the episodes won't rub anyone the wrong way, as it will really help with keeping the show going but there's a final step required to get there and i've got to ask a favor and i really need 200 of you to help me out by taking a really quick survey it's just a handful of questions about your age sex and income that helps advertisers work out the demographic behind the show so if you could please check out survey.libsyn.com slash countdown to classic libsyn is spelled l-i-b-s-y-n that would help me out a lot that web address again is survey.com L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com slash countdown to classic. I'll put the link in the show notes too, so please do consider taking 30 seconds while you listen to this podcast to help the show out there. And speaking of advertising, we have our first patron shout out. If you're a patron of the show, you may have seen that you have the ability to get a shout out. Normally I'd put it a bit later on in the episode, but it's only one, so here we go for our inaugural entry. Shout out to God Tier Gaming, which is a North American PVE alliance based Classic WoW Guild. Listener Ore and his friends are looking to build a community of fellow like-minded individuals, so please feel free to contact them via Ore in the Countdown Discord, that's O-R-A-E, for their Discord details if you're interested in delving into the depths of Classic rating within a casual environment. They're looking for people who want to enjoy rating and the social aspect of the game. And with all that housekeeping out of the way, today on Countdown, we've got Alpha Talk, we've got Kevin Jordan on Warlock, We've got the creator of the hugely popular Machinima series, Tales of the Past, from back in the day. And finally, we talk about some of the quests in-game and the pros and cons of our knowledge of them. You all know the drill by now. This is a community-based podcast. So if you like what you're hearing, please join the Discord now and keep the conversations going with us all over there. Follow me on Twitter at Count2Classic with the number 2, or email me at feedback at countdowntoclassic.com. If you'd like to call into the show, make a suggestion or just say hi. Everything you'll need is in the show notes for each episode, along with the show's Patreon link, if you'd really like to help keep the show going over there. Or if subscriptions aren't your thing, then you can help keep the lights on at Countdown to Classic by checking out the show's tip jar over at Ko-Fi. There's also the show's merch store with some great designs over there for t-shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, etc. So be sure to check that link too. And finally, just a reminder, we are guild recruiting over at Countdown to Classic, so head on over to the show's Discord to get more information on our plans for Classic. There. But with all that said, let's start the show with Calling Countdown. Alright, it's time for another countdown to classic emergency call. 
We have just had some big news drop and I've rallied the crew and we are going to have a bit of a discussion about it. I'm exceptionally hungover after a big stream drinking with a few of the guys last night, so this should be a bit of fun. But I've got the always dependable ale with me. How are you, mate? Uh, doing well. Doing better than me, I'll bet. Taladrill is here as well. How are you, mate? I'm doing fantastic. Great. And one of my partners in crime from the drinking session last night, who I hate because he's sounding much healthier than me, Locke, how are you? I'm doing perfectly fine. Oh, Wonderful day. You smug son of a bitch. <laughs> All right. So, guys, I was sitting around the house having a really nice little day in bed, watching some Game of Thrones stuff on YouTube and just recovering from my hangover. And then this big news drops at a really, really random time of the day. It was like 9.30 at night, Pacific Standard Time, on a good Friday, no less. Such an odd time to get this short, short post from Blizzard, a blue post, saying, you know, basically, I'm, I'm not going to read it out word for word, but the TLDR is, hey, guys, there's been a lot of speculation going on lately about this thing that's gone up on the CDN, being the content delivery network. Um, guess what? That's an employee. That's an internal alpha. So that's what it is. Hope that answers your question. See you later. Smoke bomb. Now, this was relieving for me to hear because some of you know, some of you don't know. Um, I have known about this for the past two and a half weeks. I was contacted by a source who gave me a fair bit of information about this. I know a bit more that we'll get into. Um, you know, I won't divulge some of the things that I know, but we'll get into what I do know later in the call. But it was really, really relieving for me to see Blizzard address this. Now I can talk about a, a, at least a little bit of what I know. And now we know what's happening. Okay, it's we didn't know whether it was an alpha, a beta, a, a, a friends and family. What is it? Well, they've said employees only alpha. So, AL, I'll start with you. Now that we know this, where does this put things for you in terms of release? I mean, I think this definitely pushes it back. Uh, I've been pretty steadfast in my stance that I don't believe we're getting a beta. and. I think I'm one of like kind of the few people who really believe that just based like you can't compare this to what any other, you know, game they've done previously because this is like uncharted territory. So for people trying to compare saying, Oh, you know, they've had a beta for BFA. That's going to happen or they're doing this or that. It, I don't, I don't think, I think they're breaking the mold with this totally. So I've, I've said since the start, I don't think there's going to be a beta. They're going to keep everything under wraps. I think this news helps to kind of confirm that as well as potentially push it bummer. Okay. Tyler Drill, I'll turn to you now. How did this news work for you? Has it affected your guess as to a release date now that you know we are in a phase where the employees are internally in an alpha? It sort of confirms what I was expecting because everybody was acting like, oh, it's going to be right around the corner, right around the corner. And I thought, I don't. I don't see that happening. You know, I think we need to see some kind of solid movement. Like they were even hashing out some real like structural decisions on these blue posts that were far before any actual finalizing. But I think too, that um, just in general, why we got a blue post at such a weird time was probably just so people didn't start hyping themselves up over the Easter weekend. I think they were just, <laughs> they were wanting to just throw some water on the fire and be like, guys, 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 this is just an alpha. And, and maybe Ale's right. Maybe they're saying this is just an alpha. And wait, did we ever confirm that we were giving you a beta? Like that was never going to happen, you know? So maybe that's what they're trying to say here too, just to keep people from salivating too much. Yeah, I guess it does help us, um, you know, not kick down the door at Irvine going, where the fuck is this beta? It's like, hey, we never said anything about a beta. So it's a very good point, Taladrill. Locke, I'll turn to you, mate. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this last night on stream um, on a call that tragically is now kind of, you know, defunct, if you will. I'll, I'll throw that in the Discord for people to have a fun listen to, but this one would supersede it now that we have this information. But going off of what you said last night versus hearing this news now, what does this mean to you? Where, you know, being at the, you know, the middle of April where we are, knowing that, you know, summer is around the corner and they've just started their internal alpha. What does that mean to you? Um, well, as I said last night, the only reason they'd put something like this on the content management system is if they wanted people to act some, at least some group of people to access it. And we now know what that group of people is. It's the employees at Blizzard. But, uh, you said it's internal. Um, 
I, I'd say it's, you know, it's internal for Blizzard, but I think it's also external in the fact that they want their employees playing this at home to test it out. They want, you know, these, at least one server up and running with Blizzard employees running around it, testing out whatever they can, having a bit of fun in their off time, I think. So I think this is like the very, very, very first stage of that testing process. And we're actually getting this, you know, see that a bit now by having access to that client, which, you know, some people have already, you know, downloaded and have been running around on their own individual little private version servers of it. Absolutely. Now, I'll jump in and just extrapolate a little bit on that point that you've raised of, you know, the nature of the internal testing process. It th- What we got from Bornak, the blue post over at the uh, forum, says, we recently began a phase of internal employee alpha testing. That's all he says. And I've, I've gone a little bit further and I've said, from what I know, it is absolutely employee only. Some people were saying like, oh, Josh, how do you know that? It doesn't say anything about that. Well, I'm adding that on. It's employee only. This is not a friends and family. This is in a situation where employees have been given a few keys and said, go out and give it to your mates and have fun running around in classic. This is as, as for everything I've seen and heard is just employees. So knowing that, do you think that, you know, appreciating that it is still an alpha, do you think that part of the reason they've gone down this route, I mean, they were always going to do internal testing, that's fine, but do you feel like they are keeping a playable version away from us because of possible blowback? Or do you, I mean, because you're saying you don't know whether we're going to get a beta or not at all, and that is still a, an option, I guess. Just release the game. Don't even do a beta. Just have this this internal alpha and then bang, it's out there. Do you think that they might be keeping it away for us from us because of potential blowback or do you think that that is i guess what i'm getting as do you think there's any problem with only having blizzard staff look at this thing and not the community at large i i think i think it's part of the process like you start internal you start with employees and then if they want to open it up to the public later which i think they probably want to do for stress testing then they do that later but for the time being, they're obviously quite happy just to keep it internal. Blizzard does most of the things it does internal and only ever tends to bring the public into it near the very end of the process. Mm. Ail, what do you reckon? Yeah, I, I feel like uh, the reason like for this especially is that there's probably a lot of bigger issues um, that they need to resolve first before, even if at all, it's released to the public. Um, there's also like another issue that people haven't really talked about if they were to go with an open beta, is that a lot of people who are kind of fence sitting on whether they're going to play or not may try it out and then maybe either be disheartened from playing it and then having their, their characters wipe or, you know, for other reasons they try and they don't like it where by them not uh, releasing a beta and just having, you know, the live version, they get people to actually play that. I don't know if that's like a big consideration for them, but um, like, I think that is something to consider. Taladrill, what's your thoughts on sort of restricting this i mean again it's not unexpected yes there's going to be internal testing but this alpha testing being restricted to the blizzard employees and not a friends and family type thing which might spread a little bit of a wider net do you think that that might limit some of the bugs that they pick up or are you pretty confident like fuck it's blizzard they made the game they're going to pick up on everything I'd really worry if they don't do some kind of beta with uh, at least some of the private server community people because there's a lot of questions. Everybody's just sitting there waiting, going, let's test this, let's test this. We want to you know, see how it goes. Um, I think Blizzard will get pretty close, but I think there's a lot of small things that they might miss. I think Ale's point is really good, though, that you know, people on the fence, they might try it out and Classic isn't really the kind of game where you play it for a couple hours and go, Hey, I don't like it. You know, you, you got to really invest. And I think that that fresh server feel gets that hype going for people. So I think, you know, maybe what they do, you know, what I would think that they should do maybe is like maybe a closed beta where they have more than alpha. They have a larger release, but it's not just any old person. Like people who are coming in fresh, they're not going to have that opportunity. It's only people who are really interested in, in trying it out. The blowback. I think that's something they have to be worried about because if they, they released it uh, too early and there's still a lot of major issues, I think that definitely like, 
you know, fire up the pitchforks because, you know, people are going to be like, wow, you guys promised us like a summer release. You've released it now. And like, you know, things aren't working still. Like what's going on? Right. And I think that would, could be disastrous. It could cause a lot of people to actually lose faith in this where so far, you know, they've done nothing but build faith. So it's kind of like, like us not seeing it is good news because we don't know that it could be bad right now. Yeah. Okay. Locked. I'll turn to you now. Listener Pat's Knights is raising in Twitch chat that obviously, hey, Apex did pretty well with no beta. We just dived straight into it. And that's a, that's a very good point to raise. Do you feel like the community at large? Now I know, you know, we're a pretty reasonable bunch, the listeners of this show and the Discord members, but the community at large, do you think that from, from what you've seen and heard and your sort of feel of the vibe of it all, do you feel like people would be pretty uh, forgiving for lots of bugs being available when we get our hands on a pl- whatever it is, whether it's a beta, whether it's the release version, the final release version of the game. Do you think that we're going to be forgiving in terms of bugs or do you think there will be a larger portion of the community than perhaps Blizzard sort of is aware of that might go, oh, fuck this, you idiots, there's bugs everywhere, I'm walking away? Uh, it really depends on what you classify as a bug. Like, is a bug going to be something that's different from the private servers? Maybe the private servers had something wrong the entire time. Or is it going to be something obvious such as the uh, MP, HP regeneration that we saw in the uh, BlizzCon demo? Like, I'm going to presume, and, you know, maybe I'm just putting a bit too much faith in Blizzard, that they've actually, you know, been going through with a fine-tooth comb over the you know, last six months trying to find all of those things. I think if we get a beta for the public, it's not going to be a beta for finding these broken bugs and so forth. It's going to be a bit of a, um, more of a server stress testing on those new features such as sharding and so forth and not really something aimed at bug hunting and so on. I reckon they're going to have most of that uh, fixed and there'll only be some really minor issues in there that are, you know, only the most hardcore of us will probably be able to actually find and uh, point out. Okay, Ail, I'll just ask you something new. Now, we were discussing also some of the screenshots that have been put out there, and obviously Tips did a video recently with some of the screenshots that, that, that he's been sent. Um, the data miners have been getting stuck into something. Now, I am far from an expert when it comes to data mining. I don't know anything about it. Can you, can you explain to people the significance of what we've seen over the last couple of days in terms of those screenshots? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because, um, I was able to actually catch a stream last night that I think is like highly against the TOS showing how people are able to get this information basically and get these screenshots. And there's a, a sandbox client that you can download uh, for BFA to actually load in data pulled off of that CDN. And because this is like an 8.0 version, you can actually run that on uh, the sandbox. So what people are doing is they're pulling in uh, the, the class of data off that CDN and yeah, sorry. Uh, they're, they're pulling the data off that CDN and they're basically loading it into what is effectively like a private server. It's like a sandbox that isn't connected to anything Blizzard. It's like internal for only like you. And then they're playing around with it, um, running around the world. All the art assets and stuff are there, but like all the like, um, you know, Blizzard side stuff isn't, uh, for example, like, you know, whatever happens on the server side. Okay. Now, There was a lot of stuff in there that I was a bit confused about in terms of, you know, high level items on, you know, low level characters and stuff. And I guess that's what data mining is all about. It's you just get to go in and pull out whatever object you can. You take the photo and it's all good to go. Taladrill, did you get any information out of those screenshots that you've been dying to find out? Did it solve any mysteries for you? Or do you think that it's all legit? It's all good? Or are you still skeptical? Or what's your take? Uh, the biggest takeaway that we saw was, uh, that items were 1.12 values. So things that had specific stat changes throughout the game, they weren't changed. They were only end game style. So that is just one more sort of confirmation that they really are not looking at doing a progressive stat itemization kind of thing. So that just makes us understand where we're at with that. You know, whether it be good or bad, I don't think it's that big of a deal per se, but it definitely uh, impacts what people were planning for things. Locke, we talked about this last night in terms of those 1.12 items, and I think I was saying, and you, you may have been, you may have been saying the same thing. It seems like it's the case where they legit just don't have that old data. At BlizzCon, we got told, look, maybe we've got the 1.9, 1.10, 1.11 stuff, who knows? But it it seems to be like maybe they don't have anything but 1.12. What do you think? 
Um, yeah, we had had a pretty long conversation about this, and basically, you know, the way we what we talked about generally was okay. Blizzard back in the day weren't just saving everything they did. They, you know, started at 1.1, and when they wanted to add things to the game, they didn't save a copy of 1.1. They just started building on top of it. And what we end up with is, you know, several patches later, they're at 1.6. They've ignored, you know, they don't have a copy of that old stuff anymore because they've just built on top of it. And eventually we get to 1.12 where they actually finally saved a copy of their data. Um, and honestly, I think it's a good thing. I think um, having that progressive itemization, uh, I, other than the PvP stuff, I wish we had the older PvP stuff in there. But otherwise, I feel like, you know, these these later items are a bit more balanced. Some of them, some of these items were pretty broken in their original forms. Some of them were a bit underpowered in their original forms. And we have these newer versions of these items that are going to be accessible from the get-go uh, once we get classic, which I think is great. Um, you know, it's going to be really fun when a warrior charges me with a 1.12 Bone Reaver's Edge and cuts me into the great. Tala Drill. Now, what are the, some of the things that you're busting to find out if, let's say, hypothetically, if you were able to run around in this alpha, what are the more pressing features for you now as to whether or not they're in the game? Um, we'd want to see some mechanics. Mostly, I would be worried mostly about exploit mechanics, um, and other just basic ones that they're working. So I'd want to see, you know, potentially like spell scaling, see how that's working for some key items. Want to see, you know, what armor, I know they said, you know, they've got armor for some of the mobs. It's like, is that what it's going to be? Or is that just like initial numbers? Um, those are the kind of things that would really, impact where things are and maybe where we'd say, hey, let's do some pushback and say maybe we need to make some changes for these things because I, I don't want the game to be broken. And and the problem is, is like some of these things may be accurate to 1.12. So it's like, well, you know, Blizzard put in what they saw, but it doesn't mean that that's the right way to do it. So that would be what I'd want to have the community be able to start talking about. That would be my biggest thing. All right. Now, Locke, how about you? Do you have a little wish list of things you want to find out about if you could get a chance to run around in the alpha? Oh, um, the biggest thing I'd actually want to find out about is um, things like uh, wall jumping and wall walking. Uh, wall walking, for those who don't know, is the, pretty much the ability to skirt around walls. That was changed in vanilla, but uh, wall jumping was not, which is basically being able to slowly jump up walls and get to areas you're not supposed to. I'd love to see if that's still there because that was a whole lot of fun back in the day. All right. Now, guys, I might sort of round out this one on the, on the home turn, unless there's anything else that you guys are, are bust. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it to you. I'll give you a bit of an open, you know, um, open question here, very open in terms of, is there anything else that, that you want to get off your chest about this particular news? Now, did this change anything else for you? Do you, um, want, do you think we're going to start hearing stories from people? Are there going to be leaks coming our way about like, oh, this is in the alpha, blah, blah, blah. What do you expect from here? Uh, I actually expect it to be quiet for a little while. I think this is, I think they came to us with this information to kind of settle down the rabble rousers a bit. I feel like with this, with this news for us, there's probably going to be a, a period of, uh, you know, less communication from Blizzard. I, they said there'll be more news soon, but I think for the time being, they kind of put this out now to quiet down the rabble rousing because if you look at what's happened in the past few days, people have been literally confirming that there is a beta coming. Like they've said, I can confirm there is a beta and then, you know, it's created this furor around it. So I think they put this out there to manage our expectations for a little while, kind of quiet everything down for a little bit. And then I think we can look to find, to get some more information in probably a couple of weeks, depending on you know, how this round of internal alpha goes. Well, that was the really hard part for me over the last few days is watching, as you say, the rabble rousing and seeing words like confirmed get thrown around, which really sort of, you know, grinds my gears um, in terms of, look, yeah, okay, the data miners found out that something was happening, but, you know, when we see things like beta confirmed, it's like, no, nothing's confirmed, settle down. But, you know, I knew what was happening and I didn't say anything and I felt like when you come out and deliver news that people don't want to hear, like it's great that Blizzard has now come out and said this, hey, guys, employee-only alpha. If I had have come out and said, hey, guys, guess what? It's an employee-only alpha. That's not necessarily what people wanted to hear because it bums them out because they had their uh hopes held quite high for, you know, open beta or what have you sometime soon. Now, I, I've 
basically decided to sit on the news because I didn't want people going, fuck this guy. He's not telling me what, what I want to hear. He's a, he's a fraudster. He's full of shit. He probably doesn't have any sources. He just wants the attention, blah, blah, blah. But now we can sort of come out and talk about it and shoot down this. Well, no, it wasn't a beta. It was something. It was an alpha. So it's good to at least have that address. And I do totally understand where Blizzard was coming from in case things went down a pretty wild rabbit hole there. So anyway, that, that's where we went with it. Now I, I, as I've sort of alluded to, I do know when this alpha ends, but you know, people can criticize me for holding on to that information. And again, I'll, I'll take your slings and arrows. I'll take the, oh, you know, he's, he's full of shit. He's just trying to hold on to something for a bit of attention dangling in front of us. He doesn't have anything. Well, I can guarantee you I do. I would have hoped that over this time I've built up some level of trust with the, the community or the listeners. Wait, sir. So you're saying that you're not going to tell us the date? Uh, next thing you're going to say is you're going to be rolling on NA as well. <laughs> I know, right? Well, no, that's exactly it. I'm, I'm not going to be telling people that, that there is a window of time when this alpha ends and I will not let people know that. I've got people PMing me already saying, Josh, you've got to tell me. Come on, man. I booked some annual leave. You've got to help me out here. I just can't because you tell one person then it all runs to hell. And also, I just think that the speculation is part of the fun. And this is what I want to ask you about, Locke, then I'd love to hear from uh, Alan Talladrill on this as well. Do you feel like there is a bit of fun in the mystery? No, I need to know now. Tell me everything you know. <laughs> Ale, what do you reckon? Um, or Taladrill, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I'll go. No, I don't care. When it comes out, it comes out. I don't <laughs> it can be next week, it can be next month, whatever. Okay. Ale? I like I like the mystery. I like the shitstorm that's been happening the last few days. So more of More of it, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think the more mystery, the better. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm completely with you. I, I just think that if you come out and say, look, this is the date that the alpha ends, then it can sort of, you know, it it absolutely might murder a certain period of time for people going, oh, well, I wanted it to, cut to come out next week, and now you've ruined that for me. And it's like it, it's only lose-lose, in my opinion. Uh, I think it can be win-win. Like you might have those people that like, oh, I was really hoping it comes out next week. You've ruined it for me. But then you'll be, you know, have those people like, oh, that's coming out at the perfect time for me. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, true. Well, anyway, I've, as I said, I've said enough. I am going to hold on to it. So that's where we're at. Um, it's good to get this information out there. Employee only internal testing has begun. It is deemed an alpha and that's where we're at. So guys, I might wind up the call here as my dog and cats go ballistic in the background. Thanks so much for joining us again, Ale. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And Taladrill, thanks for coming on at the last second, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. And locked, mate, you're a legend. You're always here for me and, and I love you. I'm sorry I can't tell you the date, but I'll make it up to you. <laughs> Thanks, man. It's uh, wonderful to be back again. Hi, everyone. Josh here. I just want to take a quick moment to remind you that while Countdown to Classic will always be a podcast you can get for free, if you do happen to really enjoy the show and find yourself always coming back for more, then please do check out the show's Patreon page to see how you can help keep the lights on at Countdown to Classic and even vote on show content as the show continues to bring you more and more classic wow goodness. Alternatively, if monthly subscriptions aren't your thing, you can always visit the show's tip jar over at Ko-Fi with that link being in the show notes and on the website too. Now, let's get back to the show. Hey everyone, just before I start this call about Warlock design with Kevin Jordan, I just want to throw in a big plug for the Warlock Classic Discord. The admin of that one, Zephan, is in on this call and he does a phenomenal job upkeeping what is one of the more active and interesting class-specific discords for Classic. The link is in the show notes, so please do head over there and say hi to Zephan and the crew if you're into everything Warlock related. Now, let's get to the call. All right, it's time for another Countdown to Classic Kevin Jordan special. Kevin Jordan in the house. How are you, mate? Doing great. How are you? Good to be back. 
I'm very well. It's good to have you back on this Easter long weekend, and I appreciate you taking the time out for this. Now, you just mentioned to me off the call before we started, and I figured I've done a bad job uh, for you um, in terms of plugging your channel because I've been doing it on my own when I should have been inviting you to do it the last couple of calls. We've missed out on it. But as you just mentioned to me, you've got undergone a bit of a name change over at your Twitch channel. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I was failure analysis and now I'm, um, Kevin Jordan is my Twitch handle. So twitch.tv slash Kevin Jordan to find me. Took the big plunge in, in going with the self named uh, channel. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you. Now, look, everyone, I'm just going to state again on Kevin's behalf. Please do go and throw him a follow. Throw him a sub, show him some love over at Twitch there. He does great work. A lot of you have been telling me that you've been dropping on over to his channel. You've been saying hello. Get in there. Say Countdown sent you and say hello. He'd love to hang out with you all. And joining us for this call, we've got a warlock specialist who I've been dying to talk to. I've seen you around the Discord traps for some time now. Zephan, how are you? Thank you for having me, Josh. Uh, I'm more than fine. Not looking forward to the early shift tomorrow, but it should be fine. <laughs> yes, it's very late at night where Zephan is, so I've kept him up, but he was more than happy to stay up for this particular call. He's dying to talk to Kevin, so I can't wait to get into it. Kevin, you know how we do now. Let's talk Warlocks. Yes. I'll start you out generally. Were you happy? Uh, yes, I was very happy. I mean, that's that's generally how I feel about all the classes, but the Warlock was very unique in the sense that we called him sort of internally the freak class where he was just different than what all the other uh, classes and different than what other games had offered to this point. So we wanted to make something that was pretty unique and warlocks both in name and in, you know, lore from the Warcraft universe were very different. And so we got to pull off something that was very different. And uh, I think it served that role really well. Were there any um, sort of gaming archetypes that you looked to, you know, obviously you guys, you've mentioned before that you guys sort of didn't mean to reinvent the wheel. You just looked to perfect the one that was already in existence a little bit when Blizzard decided to dive into the MMO waters with World of Warcraft. With the Warlock right. build, was there something that you used as a little bit of a point of reference? Uh, yeah, we were strongly influenced by the Necromancer from EverQuest. That was sort of their freak class. Uh, they also had a, um, the Dark Knight. What was it called? I can't remember now, but, um, yeah, so the Necromancer was a strong influence. And just, we were looking for like that sort of evilish class, not outwardly evil, but like you weren't really sure about this guy, sort of in a way that the rogue didn't have. Cause we sort of positioned our rogues as, you know, a combination of assassin, yes, but also like scoundrel or, uh, spy, you know, like the SI7 guys. Lovable asshole as well was another one, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so he was more, he was closer to neutral in terms of alignment along with like many of our other classes. But so we wanted the warlock to be sort of the, the king of, you're not really sure about this guy. You know, he sneaks off into these underground places in the city to do his weird stuff with the rest of his, you know, rest of his cohorts. And you're just not really sure. And then also, of course, yeah, he summons demons occasionally, and he tells you they're under control, but sometimes he summons a, an infernal or a doom guard and things go badly. So that was the idea, and I think it worked pretty well. Okay. Now I'm being told in chat by Phalor that the the class you might have been thinking of was Shadow Knight in EverQuest. Shadow Knight, that's, that's correct. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Phalor. Now... I'll just um, start with a listener question again before we get into the specs as we do in these segments. But I've got this one that I'm sure a lot of people are wondering about. It does come up quite often from Otter Poppin, who says this, Kevin, soul shards, why no stacking? Was it intentional for locks to be able to or have to go out and farm for lots of them before raids? How do you feel about the path? that you guys took with soul shards in uh, vanilla and also how they went in the current game? Uh, yeah. So it, it really came down to, we wanted soul shards to be, you know, a, a limited resource. And so we could have said, yeah, they can stack, they can stack up to 20, they can stack up to a hundred, but then you would have just sort of acquired them. And at some point it would have stopped being a limiting resource. So having them stack to one, no stacking meant that you had to have really big bags to plan for long adventures if you wanted to use some of your more powerful effects throughout, right? So 
that was the way we controlled it and made that a limiting resource. So limiting resources are always sort of an, an annoyance as well as a gameplay thing. You know, uh, ammo is the same way. And, you know, any simulation, it's like you need these 10 things and simulations only really work when, uh, you can only really acquire six of the 10 things you need, you know, so you're always starving for something. So that was sort of the dynamic of the philosophy behind some of our resource systems was that if you just stack them up infinitely, it's going to stop being a resource and you're not going to care about it. And then at at that point, why even add it? I actually have a question that fairly uh, lines up with the previous question, and that is where uh, named soul stones ever considered from uh, the targets that you have slain. Oh, um, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I I think we did toy with that idea at some point. Um, Maybe not named ones, but power level ones, so that if you took shards from elites, you could use them to greater effect on some of your spells. Um, Oh, that would have actually been really cool, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it turned out to be pretty ambitious in terms of um, (laughs) each individual spell having up to, you know, three or four outputs based on the soul shard use and then trying to figure out the UI for how do you tell the game which soul shard you're going to use, you know, that kind of thing. So it turned out to be too ambitious an idea for what we had time for. Well, speaking of ambitious ideas, Kevin, just piggybacking off of one of your previous answers, listener Tian SG, who is a, a Warlock um, veteran, asked the following. He says, wow, Warlocks bring to mind a common fantasy class, the Necromancer, as you've obviously discussed with, you know, that being based mm-hmm. off of what was happening in EQ. But with the Warlocks, they didn't have the raising of the dead. Did you guys ever consider making locks Necromancers as well? Uh, in terms of raising dead, yeah. In terms uh, of like no. a raising dead type thing. Well, that was the you know soul stone basically is the what came out of that idea. Like we liked that uh, there was a non healer class essentially that had access to resurrection abilities, and so the, the soul stone was basically our take on non healer mm-hmm. resurrection. You know, as as I've said many times, we always try to do things that were really unique to each class. So, you know, the Druid having only a combat res and the Warlock having a totally different mechanic for how he gets people resed. It was a a preparation thing rather than an after the fact thing. So that was our take on it. Okay. Zeph and I've got one more and then you might have a question that arises out of Kevin's answer to this. But again, we'll turn to listener Rafe who asked this. It originally seemed like Warlocks were intended to have the option of being a melee caster class with the way certain talents and firestones worked. Was that the case? And if so, what made you abandon it? Uh, yeah, so we had, we had a few things about the Warlock that, uh, felt different in, in sort of his spellcasting kit. Uh, some of it was like a point blank area of effect spells like Hellfire where we felt like there would be times where he would be in the mix. There's also just this general philosophy of the Warlock is high risk, high reward in terms of kit. You know, like he damages himself in order to deal more damage. So it's uh, you're always sort of playing with fire, if you will, with the class. And so we liked different things that put him in dangerous situations in order to accomplish the things that he wanted to do. So the idea that he would be meleeing instead of, you know, using a wand was really intriguing to me. Uh, and that's why we set up things like he could use melee weapons. And we had the Firestone, of course, which I'm sure people want to talk about. But uh, that tied in with the thematic approach of he takes risks. You know, he plays with fire. He summons these forces from nefarious places to do his bidding. And they're, they're, he wasn't always in complete control. So that that's kind of what led to some of those decisions. All right, Zephan, I'll throw it to you, mate. What have you got? Okay, so talking about fire, um, was there ever the idea to use anything besides uh, shadow bolts for raiding, like uh, in the PVE environment? Would the fire been uh, one of the options, or why was that never really explored? Uh, yeah, it was certainly uh, it was certainly the the basic premise that he have access to two very strong elemental kits, one being fire, one being shadow. So the problem with that approach is always you can't just have double the number of spells, you know, with each spell having a shadow flavor and a fire flavor. So you have to work into the broader kit 
ways of getting shadow in there meaningfully and ways to get in their fire more meaningfully. So vanilla, we didn't really accomplish that very well, uh, but we got better with that later on as we recognized where we needed to improve things. And so in the later expansions, you know, the fire lock versus the shadow lock became a more viable thing. Okay, okay. Cool, cool. There's been a, a few people that uh, really try to make the uh, Firelock dream do work in uh, mm-hmm. Classic, actually. But right. the main issue is being that the main spell is Searing Pain, which has a double threat modifier. Right. So people have been looking yeah. for a way around to get uh, threat-free DPS, in, uh, so to speak. Right. On that Searing Pain thing, sorry, sorry, Zephan, I just want to hear what Kevin has to say about that, because it's funny you raised that, Zephan. A listener did ask, sorry, I've forgotten the listener's name, about Searing Pain, and Kevin, what was the deal with the, the amount of threat that was attached to it? Was that by design specifically to try and make people really think about using it? Uh, yes. I mean, the, the high threat, we did this with Mind Blast as well on the Priest, uh, both of those were intended not to be sort of uh, group spells. They were more for uh, soloing, where you didn't have to worry about threat. With the with the warlock also having a pet, that was theoretically tanking for him during soloing, if you were using big blue, then there were more considerations there. But that's essentially what we did with spells that we wanted it to be risky or dangerous to use in group combat. So they had decent damage outputs, but the cost was this is much harder to use in a group scenario. Okay, great. Sorry, go for it, Zephan. I cut you off before. Okay, okay, okay. So with Thread being the main issue for Firelock, something that people have come up with is uh, what we like to call the uh, machine gun imp, mm-hmm. with, uh, which basically uh, depends on a, on a few things. And that is right. you're, you're uh, buffing your imp. His normal firebolt cost is two seconds. And with your talents, you can get that down to one second and you can like boost its DPS with improved imp and uh, getting fell intellect so it doesn't go oom as quickly. And then in engineering, you actually have a uh, pet that you can summon, the Arcanite's Draggling, which, uh, so I might be getting a little bit technical here. That's all right. right. (laughs) It's just a fun concept, so, uh, Mm -hmm. which can apply a debuff. And this debuff, uh, is believed to be either 30 or 60, uh, Flat fire damage to fire spells. Okay. Uh, that stacks up to five times. So for a total of either 150 or 300, it's not like very clear what it exactly is. And with your imp shooting once a second, that does add up to a fair amount of damage. Is that something that you guys would have considered or like a happy, uh, afterthought or? I don't know. Yeah, that's more of a happy afterthought. Then the one, the one thing I would would not have particularly liked is that in order like in order to be the highest dps fire lock you would have to be engineering right that would be the one sad part about that if it didn't require you be an engineer and i can't remember that specific item then i think that's pretty cool that you could just go you know talk if you knew an engineer or if you were an engineer you could make that happen so i consider that just cool emerging gameplay you can have like your friends or fellow raiders uh uh, use the Arcanite Dragonling, and the debuff oh, okay. will uh, is a it's a debuff that gets applied, so uh, oh, very holds cool. true for okay. everyone. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I like that, Kevin. I've got one last one just before we get into the specific spec questions. Now, this okay. is from Bissy eighty seven, and you've already sort of seen this one coming, Kevin, when you said, "I guess that I'm going to get some questions about this about um the Firestones and." And Bissy87 asks, what was the reasoning or thoughts behind the Firestone that Warlocks make that enchants the main hand weapon with attack power? And sort of piggybacking off of that, Dumbhammer adds, for Warlocks, again, what were the thoughts on Firestone and Spellstone? They did not stack with the enchants, so it was pointless to use them as enchants were much better. So what can you say about that? So originally the idea, of course, was uh, to create an alternative for the wand. And also, like, at the beginning, there weren't, you know, offhand items weren't really prevalent. So it took a while to find, not everyone had access to really great offhand choices. So if you did have a single, you know, one-handed weapon, there was nothing to, your your slot was just empty all the time. So that's where the kind of idea is, what are we going to do to fill in that slot for a lot of warlocks that we're playing? And so that's where these stones uh, came into being. We thought it was a cool idea. And then also just to help with fire damage, which was behind shadow damage in a lot of cases. And just to create a cool image, which was the warlock using this sword that was enhanced with fire and running into melee, which I always thought was a really cool 
image, you know, from my love of Gandalf and whatnot. So that was the basic idea. It not working with the enchants or stacking with the enchants. Yeah, it's one of those things where sometimes those decisions are made to, to free up choice. Uh, because if you, if you have two sources, you can sometimes, it, it actually expands your choices on what to enchant and what to use in your offhand rather than limiting choice. So, uh, sometimes those stacking decisions were made to actually create uh, more opportunity for choice because then you can enchant with something else because you were getting that source from, or getting that bonus you needed from somewhere else. All right. Now, Zephan, I'm going to queue up the spec questions now. So think of what you've got in terms of spec related questions, or if you can craft the questions you already had into uh, sort of the certain specs, but um, I'll kick us off, Zephan, and, and throw over to you because we'll start with demonology, mm-hmm. if that's okay, Kevin. And yeah. th- right. this one's from Rafe again, who says this. What was the ho- the thought behind making demonic sacrifice a prerequisite for Soul Link? Uh, yeah, early on, we had some strange prerequisites for sure. Uh, a lot of them were too restrictive. Sometimes we felt like and this and this design I don't necessarily agree with anymore, but sometimes we felt like certain talents weren't appealing enough, but we felt were really good for players to have as part of their kit. And so we made them prereqs in order to ensure that people had access to them, even though they sort of wouldn't take them normally. So it was sort of a, a weird way to approach it. And we, as you as you probably remember, we backed off on prereqs pretty significantly and changed our philosophy uh, later on as we expanded and upgraded the trees. So, but that was some of the reasoning uh, that would have been in place for a lot of trees with certain um, with certain elements of prereqs or certain elements of the talents. Okay, Zephan, go for it. What do you got for demonology? Okay, so it goes to the question about spell zones. Like the offhand mm-hmm. that you create is fairly important for uh, PvP. Is probably the strongest PvP offhand that there is. So warlocks are really glad with that one. The fire zone mm-hmm. a little bit less, but spell zone fucking mints, right? But the thing is, it's on the uh, thirty talent uh, point mark, right next to right. soul link. It's the only uh, we are the only class that have such a, a double like master talents, so to uh, mm-hmm. speak, in a tree. Uh, at least after the revamps of talents. So uh, I believe Shaman's used to have something similar, yeah, uh, which sure kind of makes it hard to uh, go for those talents because that means yeah. you're going to miss out on something important in the other trees. Right. So I'm kind of wondering why that is. Uh, that was sometimes just an artifact of you didn't get the spell until really late in the shaman's career. And so one of the rules on talents was you can't offer a talent that modifies something that you don't have yet. And so if spellstone didn't actually appear in your spell book until late, that meant that we had to push the talent that modified it way down the list. And later on, we got a little better at bundling things so that it would give a soulstone bonus and something else that that was sort of generic or usable with another spell that you already had and we could place that talent earlier but in the beginning our our talents were pretty one-to-one we barely bundled things and they were all pretty simple in terms of you know tooltip readability and what they gave you so i can't remember the specifics but that was why some of those talents were so deep in the tree because they affected spells that were given later in the in the cycle Okay, cool. I just looked and Spellstone is uh, level 36, like the first rank of it. So that right. would make sense. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, I've got the next one. And this is from listener Hathos, who says this. Somewhat of a weird question, but why not, I guess. Was the warlock pet Doomguard ever intended to have a role in raids, particularly looking at their cripple spell, which reduced an enemy's attack and movement speed? Yes, absolutely. We actually, yeah, we wanted the big pets to be uh, usable in more situations. It was a really fine line though, because the power level versus the cost or risk is always really difficult to balance around. But yeah, we wanted to put a very, very powerful effect on the Doom Guard because of how difficult it was to summon. It cost you a, a player, basically, if you did the ritual, or it was random, which could make it really difficult to control if all of a sudden it was popping out at a bad time, you know, and you had to switch over doing damage or some other important task to try to enslave it and get it going on your side. So if you could manage the scenarios, 
then we wanted to give you a very powerful mechanic for the Doom Baron. Okay. Zephan, anything to finish on demonology with? No, nah, man. Uh, I th- I'm fairly fine for demonology. <laughs> okay, no worries. Let's move on, guys, to Affliction. Now, Zephan, uh, I'll, I'll get you to kick us off here. I'm sure you've probably got a few questions about Affliction. What have you got for Kevin? So one of the things is, it may be a little bit of a technical question, but it's kind of hard to skip when you're talking about dots and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, with the debuff limit being in the game, going from yes. 8 to 16 debuff, debuff limit, Probably boosted Warlocks the most, right? We got more access right. to uh, spell modifiers. We got to use our corruption and stuff like that. And if you would remove the uh, debuff limit altogether, we got to use even more uh, right. debuffs and probably become the top PS in the game, right. even beyond Warriors. However, we we do have the 16 debuff uh, slot limit. Yes. Was there a certain priority system built in that you can recall with some general rules to it? I could do a uh, go a bit in depth about that. <laughs> yeah, we, we talked at, at length many, many times about priority systems and way to basically the ways to work around the debuff limit because it was not something designers wanted in the game, but it was just a technical limit we had to deal with. So we talked to, through a lot of systems, but uh, those systems were so finicky uh, in terms of trying to guess what players wanted and with the game changing so often in terms of patches, you know, where we buff or debuff certain spells or effects, you know, I should say buff or nerf, that was just an ongoing process of always trying to guess what, you know, order, or what the priority list would be. So it became this monumental task on top of all the other things we had to do in order to get it working. So, yeah, it's just a poor side effect to the fact that we had to deal with a technical limit that we didn't really want but was there regardless. Okay. I got another question. And it's actually about one of the first two talents that you can choose as a, mm-hmm. as a warlock. So other casters are other classes, but it's mainly a thing for casters because uh, versus bosses, um, the hit cap is 16%, right? Which is a lot, especially for early on because there's not a lot of gear with hit on it. Right. And as warlocks, we get hit, but it's hit for afflection spells. And basically, in a raid... At best, you apply two Affliction spells, and for the rest of it, you're pretty much casting Shadow Bolt until you need to refresh right, right. one of those. So I was kind of wondering, why don't we get just general hit, like mages do and stuff like that? Right. Uh, well, the, the problem with hit talents was when if you offered too much in the talents, it meant that you didn't have to get as much gear. You know, you didn't have to get as much hit from gear. And so we wanted gear to remain really important. And since the hit cap uh, was such a, you know, instant fall off. You know, once you had your max and all you needed, then the stat became worthless. We were really careful with spell hit throughout the trees. Uh, the reason it applied to affliction spells was because affliction spells made, like missing a dot changed your gameplay in, a, in not necessarily a fun way. So getting, ensuring that your dots landed was much more important to us than ensuring that like a shadow bolt landed. Uh, because you're probably just going to cast another Shadow Bolt after the first one and just kind of be bummed that you, you missed. But with a dot, it like you expected to move on to the next step in your rotation. And because it didn't, you have to go back. And so it was more clumsy when you missed the dot. So that's why we offered it to dots and not the rest of the, the rest of the talents. Okay. Fair enough. But real, I do realize that it's awkward to have like, you know, you're trying to get spell maximum spell hit and then you have this talent that. Once you get spell hit, you unspec out of because you're already kind of maxed with your gear. So there were some awkward things for sure with spell hit and hit in general. I got another question, and this is kind of it's again a little bit uh, technical. I can't help myself, but yeah. um, there are, there are two talents that increase uh, shadow uh, spells in general, and it's the main difference between. Uh, the two rating specs, like the two more popular rating specs as Firelock is off the table. Um, mm-hmm. That is Shadow Mastery Rune and uh, Demonic Sacrifice Rune. And it is believed that one of those does affect modifiers for things like Life Tap, and the other one only affects offensive spells. I was yeah. wondering, I haven't really found anything on, in patch notes and stuff like that to confirm anything of that kind of right. nature, and I was wondering if by any chance you will remember that. So uh, right. uh, Shadow Mastery, basically in a tooltip, says uh, it increased damage dealt or life drained 
by your shadow spells by 2%. Mm-hmm. And for demonic sacrifice, it says it's by 15%, but it's for the shadow damage done. That's why it's believed that the shadow damage part also applies to life tap, whereas the uh, shadow spells ones would not apply to uh, life. Right. Um, yeah, I don't remember the specifics, sadly. Uh, yeah, I know it's oddly specific, but <laughs> yeah, some of the some of the could have been the technical limitations of the way we had to build certain effects, and you know the modifiers we had that were in code to affect those things. Uh, so I may not have been able to set it up exactly how I wanted to, but I honestly I don't remember that specific interaction well enough to say what I wanted or what I was limited to. Okay. Kevin, I've got a, a sort of more generic question that I forgot to put in the start. Um, <laughs> that's, that's okay, Zevin, it's all good, mate. It's, it's all fine. Um, but I was going to ask in terms of you've talked before about, you know, in your dream version of vanilla wow a lot of the classes could basically do a little bit of everything um right. and you've talked about you know your desire for more tanky specs in the game discipline priest and whatnot well here's the warlock with their you know pets was there a, a thought in your head at the time of wanting them to be a little bit tankier than they were uh yes we actually intended for or originally the idea was that you know the void walker could tank certainly dungeon trash bowls and, you know, smaller group content, like two or three man quests, you know, they could tank those, you know, the bosses of those types of things. But once it got to the dungeon level, like later on, uh, where you were fighting like the end boss of a dungeon of a five man dungeon, we wanted him to sort of take a back seat to a player because it's uh, way more fun for each player to fulfill the role rather than have an AI controlled thing or even a semi, you know, per, uh, player controlled thing, be the one tanking. So, but we definitely intended for him to be, you know, a pretty good tank up to a point. Hmm. And just piggybacking off of that, did you have any slight regrets over the gameplay style that emerged where most people just use that void walker for the duration of their leveling experience and don't really diversify much at all? Uh, no, I mean, the, the reason that we had so many different pets, uh, was sort of to appeal to players that liked a lot of different options. And so, um, once you allow players to be creative, it was always, it was never in my interest to like criticize their choices or force them to play differently what they found themselves playing. So I always prefer in design to give them up players opportunities to be creative and make interesting choices and then just let them go with it. See where it takes them. Okie dokie. Zephan, have you got anything more for affliction? Yeah, man. Uh, I got a question about dark pact actually. Okay. Dark pact is like the master talent in the affliction tree, which Mm -hmm. uh, allows you to actually steal the mana from your pets and use it for your own gain. Right. Right. So you get a whole chunk of mana back, uh, even a hundred percent of your, Mm-hmm. And uh, a few people have uh, started accustoming uh, to use that in their leveling experience. So what they'll right. do is that uh, once they get to that talent, they'll ditch, ditch their voice walker and they'll use their imp basically as a mana battery, right? right. And they'll okay. be uh, what's called drain tanking, using drain of life to keep their held up and stuff like that and mm-hmm. just keep going ham and ham. I was actually wondering if there was more planned for Dark Pact and, rather than it only being used for leveling and stuff like that. Yeah, those kinds of ideas, we didn't, like, when I when I design spells or effects or abilities, whatever it is, um, I try not to put restrictions on or focus too much on one area of the game, uh, typically. So, uh, but a lot of times I'm, I open it up for emerging gameplay uh, to make sure it's usable. And it's definitely within the kit of the Warlock to, like, drain from living creatures, you know, in order to, to benefit himself. So that, that hit the thematic mark. Uh, but then how players ended up using it, I was hoping it would be usable in more places. Um, but, you know, the way it just turned out, it turns out that leveling is the place where you uh, need, or at least how it is nowadays, where you need the most efficiency in, on a, in one respect. So I definitely didn't want it to not be used in other parts of the game. But, you know, the different parts of the game are so unique that I'm not surprised that it's not used. And that's okay. All right, Zephan, if it's okay, we might move on to Destruction. Now, Zephan, have you got anything in relation to that particular talent tree? 
Oh, yeah, man. Why do we not get some threat reduction like uh, the other cl- uh, caster <laughs> classes or any other yeah. DPS uh, in the game? Yeah, that's <laughs> that would have been uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it turned out in a lot of our balancing around, you know, for raids, that threat was the limiter for damage. And so adding threat reduction was just a straight uh, DPS increase. Uh, but it's the strangest one in terms of, you know, a talent tree. Uh, just because, you know, for a lot of people that don't raid and don't really understand the threat versus dangerous, you know, mechanics of high end content, they always look at those and go, man, what a waste, or I don't really understand that, or is that even good, you know? And so those were, those were sometimes hard sells to put in. Um, I can also say that thematically, again, I, I go to that word. <laughs> it didn't seem appropriate for the warlock to, you know, sort of be softening his threat, right? Like it, it seemed like he is a high risk, you know, class, a high risk themed character class. And so this idea that if he got big, huge crits on his shadow bolts, those would be somewhat scary moments as well as, you know, exciting moments. So we liked how some of that played out. Okay. I did actually forget about one talent, and that's Master Demonologist, but that's back in the uh, Demonology tree. That's all right, mate. Go for right. it. Um, yeah, yeah. And that uh, talent uh, is based on which uh, pet you have out. And the effect is, if you have your imp out, you actually do get threat reduction. But right. that doesn't. You're not. You're not reaching that talent because there are other uh, talents that are more optional right. or like right. uh, optimal for uh, P- PVE DPS. Right. So. Yeah, and that was just a straight attempt to get Master Demonologist a little higher. It also fit in with the imp theme in that it was, you know, sort of off the radar. It was hidden and it was, uh, I can't remember the term, but it was phased out, you know, the, so that fit. The face, was it face shift or something? What was it? Yeah, yeah it's it's even called face, I believe. Oh, okay. No, or shifted, face shifted, shifted, could shifted, could that be it? Face shifted, mm. yeah, that sounds familiar. Face shift, yeah. Well, um, Kevin, I'll... Cut back to um, destruction just because you talked about shadow bolts and we often bring up, you know, some of these classes and specs being somewhat limited in terms of end game rating because they turn into maybe one button spam. And we've talked about the mages and their frostbolt spam and what have you. Now, warlocks as well get not perhaps to that extent, but pretty much do get pigeonholed into being shadow bolt spammers. Was that something right. that was a bit of an unfortunate result of the way they were designed? Or what do you, what do you think about that and how it's come about? Yeah, that was purely just a function of uh, how we didn't do the best job making sure that the scaling elements on every spell were equivalent. So at the start, you would never trade out your dots uh, for just more shadow bolts. They were very efficient and they were good, you know, damage for the time you spent, you know, damage per global sort of thing. But their scaling elements didn't, uh, didn't survive to the highest, you know, levels of performance in the game where a shadow bolt did. And so we had to make changes that complicated the spells, um, but uh, kept them, you know, more competitive later on. And that helped bring them back into the rotations. But a lot of the classes had that problem where an ability was really good at the start, but then once you scaled up, it stopped being worth pressing. Okay. Anything more on destruction, Zephan? You, you might have one or two more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So about improved firebolt, you know, making our uh, machine gun imp uh, a reality. Uh, mm-hmm. The normal like cast time for firebolt is, is two seconds, and the global cooldown is one and a half seconds for players right. at least. Um, yeah. And the, the talent reduces it by a half a second per point up to two yeah. points. So that would make it one second. So would that, right. would the global cooldown like apply to pets? And is this talent faulty and useless to go two out of two? Or is that? Uh, no, it was, like, it was intended to break that rule essentially. There were a few places that we broke that rule. Um, and I felt like it was appropriate and cool here to break that rule so that the imp would just be again the machine gun sort of spamming firebolts. Yeah, most definitely neat, man. Cool. Yeah. All right, Zeph, we might go one more on destruction and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Otherwise, Kevin will be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything other uh, specific for uh, destruction. 
That's okay. No worries. Well, look, Kevin, we'll get into the uh, the final questions as we usually do. Anything that hit the cutting room floor for Warlocks that you can remember? Uh, cutting room floor. Yeah, that's a tough one. I'm trying to think of other demon ideas that we had that didn't make it. Uh, maybe a Voidwalker quest for the gnomes would have been nice, so we don't need to go to Elven Forest. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was more on the quest design team, but yeah. There were quite a few of the uh, class quests that were... Like, some of them were amazing, and some of them were super annoying. So, yeah, I'm not surprised to hear the Warlock had some of those as well. But uh, Cutting Room Floor and the Warlocks, I can't... Uh, well, you could say Banish uh, struggled, but it, it it made it in. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it was a bit different in the beta, wasn't it? Wasn't it a bit more expansive? Yeah, like, that, him being a crowd controller was basically what it came down to. And that, like him being a crowd control, definitely hit the cutting room floor, right? So, you know, Banish started out, as long as you had Soul Stones, you just spam Banish and you were a great crowd controller. Um, sort of an annoying crowd controller because a lot of times you'd kill the, the trash pull, except for that one that was stuck in your bubble and there was no way to get him out because you couldn't cancel the spell. So everyone had to sit there and wait for the full duration to wear out. But ultimately, we didn't want him to be a really strong, reliable crowd control class. So we had to change up banish to be you know in a number of ways like adding a huge long cooldown or uh um making it versus you know certain targets only mm. so All right. yeah he started as a bigger crowd control class but ended up we not us not wanting to do that all right kevin i'll ask my last question zephan while i'm doing this think of one last question for Hev- for kevin and then we'll we'll let him go on on warlocks but kevin i'll ask you as i usually do um mm-hmm. if you could go back in time if you could change anything about warlocks were you pretty happy with their balance or what if anything if i pressed you i know that everyone's pretty happy with warlocks in 1.12 particularly what if anything would you change i would definitely try to fix the shadowball spam i would also you know, same with hunters. I would have, I would have wanted like again. This is magic wand sort of situation. Like I would have wanted their pathing and AI to have been better, so that they weren't like super annoying in like dungeon runs and things where everyone was begging you to get rid of it to avoid you know wipes and things like that. So those would have been a couple areas I would have tried to improve more. Mm, no worries. I'm sorry, Zephan. One last one from me. I lied before, just before I turn over to you because, um, uh, listener, <clears throat> anal for bestia has just piped up in chat and asked a really good one. Kevin, we didn't address this during the paladin call. What's the deal right. with the mounts? What was the reason behind giving warlocks and paladins, uh, sort of at the epic quest behind their mounts? Yeah. So. This is definitely, you know, fits within the theory of we try to do every class make its its own little special snowflake, right? So uh, both in gameplay and, and, you know, sort of perks and things that they bring or provide uh, to, you know, other players during group situation or so, solo situations, things like that. And the Paladin Mount is, a, is an old classic D&D thing, right? Like where you get to a certain level and suddenly your steed rides up and you're like, oh, I guess this is my awesome new toy. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of that is historical. And then we also thought it would be cool to do a really sweet demon mount, you know, that would be very thematically strong and powerful looking and, and evil, you know, looking to support the warlock. And it would also be uh, another thing we always try to do with uh, each class is to make it visually distinct immediately, right? So if you see a character riding, you know, a dread steed, you knew instantly that's a warlock. You don't have to wait to see, you know, what kind of spells he's throwing or anything like that. So it was just another one of those things that helped make him really distinctive visually. Okay. Zephan, go for it. What's your final question for Kevin? Okay, man. Warlock's got one of their favorite uh, PvP spells a little bit later on, uh, namely Death Coil. Like the instant right. cast, uh, healing you with the leech effect uh, and the horror effect immediately all in one. Could this have, uh, could the World of Rowcraft videos have had anything to do with that? I'm not uh, sure if you're familiar with those, but. Yeah, I have seen some of them. Yeah, it's funny about Death Coil. I think, it, I think this is one of those rare cases where I got impatient because Death Coil was a uh, Death Knight ability, right? But I just really wanted to get it in the game. I really loved that spell. And so I ran out of patience and I was like, well, we're not getting the death knight anytime soon. So let's put, 
you know, let's assume that that those tor- uh, kinds of forces come from the same place and the warlock could get this spell early or earlier than the death knight. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, look, guys, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Zephan, let me thank you so much for jumping in and asking so many great questions. I hope you got a kick out of that. Oh, most definitely, man. Uh, thank you for having me, Jaws. And uh, thank you, Kevin, for uh, making Vanilla into what it was. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for asking these great, great questions. Nice to talk to you. And thank you, Kevin. We'll see you on the next call. Oh, of course. It's always a pleasure. All right, it's time for another countdown to Classic Call. And we have a very special guest here today, Martin Fouch of the amazing Tales of the Past series. Martin, I'm, I'm so sorry. I should have asked. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. Did I get reasonably close? Yeah, I thought it was pretty close. <laughs> Excellent. That's a good start. All right. And obviously to uh, discuss this with Martin, as we do on Countdown to Classic, we would like to bring a few other people in to uh, join these group calls. And as always, the one, the only, Death Camp. How are you, mate? What's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm doing great, mate. It's so good to have you here. And it wouldn't be a call with Def Camp or or his brother Meldron, who's sadly not with us today. But um, we've got you know their running mate, our good friend Orkbit. How are you, mate? Hey, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's been too long. It's been way too long between drinks. Now, let me explain the reason why these two uh, knuckleheads are here to talk to Martin. Now, we love them like sons. These guys actually brought up the Tales of the Past series to me on the show relatively recently. I had never heard of Tales of the Past, and a few months ago, I forget which call it was, you guys started talking about it, and I think the the... Three of us were on a call with Meldron, I believe, and Meldron and I hadn't heard of it. And you guys were like, what the fuck? How have you not heard of Tales of the Past? <laughs> exactly. None of us are perfect. It's okay. And so Meldron and I were like, huh, all right, well, we'll have to go away and watch this stuff if it comes with such a high recommendation. And I, I know I did. I presume Meldron did at some point. but Yes, he did. He watched it all that night. Fantastic. I, I was yep. absolutely blown away. And um, I, I must say that I completely understand why you girls, uh, girls, why you guys fangirled, <laughs> <laughs> why you guys fangirled as much as you did over the series. But we've managed to track down Martin. I couldn't be happier to speak to him. So I'm going to let you guys, um, you know, throw in a bunch of questions as we go through this interview. Martin, let's kick off. I've delayed long enough. Can you tell us how Tales of the Past came about? Yeah, sure. So... <laughs> So uh, I think, uh, like probably a lot of uh, a lot of players have done. I, I tried to experiment a bit uh, back in the old old days on uh, on just recording some videos for fun. Um, so I didn't have any great ambitions in the start. Uh, I like creating stuff and uh, I like producing stuff uh, in the past. And and I thought it would be fun to see, you know, what kind of things can you do in this uh, in this medium. So uh, I, I did some initial movies uh, with just my own character in the very start. And then after that, I did, I think, a small movie about the guild I was in, Eden Aurora. And uh, and I think those movies are probably available somewhere on the dark web. Um, but uh, but they were really, <laughs> really cheesy, really, uh, really poor quality um, quality stuff. Um, but but uh, it, it sort of got me started and, and, and I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, then I think the the reason for moving into this was probably that, like many others, I'd spent uh, quite some time with uh, with the game, and um, and I think I had this feeling that uh, that I was actually on my way to to stop uh, stop playing, um, and I felt I wanted some sort of uh, output from uh, from that experience and uh, and something that I that was tangible. Um, to have afterwards, and I think that was one of the motivations for going in. And then I just wanted to see, you know, where could you take this? Um, so I think I just started uh, making these movies, and uh, and after I made the the first Tales of the Past uh, movie, then I found out that it was quite popular, in particular in uh, mm-hmm. in our own server and and on Warcraft movies, which was fairly new back then. Uh, there was a lot of positive response. Uh, I think today that that movie has, I think, one million uh, views or downloads on Warcraft movies. Um, so, so it got reasonably popular, uh, and I think that motivated me to just keep going. So, the first movie was very much uh, just put together uh, on the fly, 
And a bit the same with the second movie where I think I had like maybe 10 pages of, uh, of script before I went in. And then I just sort of uh, did it all uh, on the run. Um, for the second movie, I had some ideas of what, uh, what could be cool to do. Uh, I think one of my main sort of things I envisioned was uh, I wanted to try and see how many players could be pulled together for a single scene. Uh, so if some of you have seen the second movie, or if you Google, uh, I think, Tales of the Past 2 uh, battle scene, you will be able to see uh, the scene where, where we, which is probably one of my most fun uh, memories from, from recording these movies. Uh, it's where I, I spend two or three weeks uh, pulling together a, a lot of guilds across uh, both the Horde faction and then the Alliance. Uh, I played Alliance myself. And uh, and basically pulling all of these people together on a PvP server. And I think we had around 500 players lining up uh, across both sides and uh, and just managing to have all of these players uh, stand still uh, for sufficient time to record the stuff was uh, was quite fun and, uh, and a, a really awesome experience. Um, and trying to control it all, uh, I had like 10 people on uh, Ventrilo, I think it was called back then, and then mm-hmm. asking them to manage each of their own rate groups uh, for for this to uh, to work out it was uh, quite a uh, quite cool. So so I think the second movie got uh, got uh, more popular than the first, and then uh, then when I went into the third movie, I figured that uh, that this should be the end movie, and I, and I wanted to make sure that it had a uh, had an impact. So I think I invested a bit more in doing a rather long script and uh, finding uh, professional voice actors for some of the roles. And uh, in general, just spending quite a quite a bit of time uh, trying out new techniques and uh, and taking it uh, taking it up a notch. So uh, so yeah, that, it was something that I did in my spare time just for kicks. Uh, while uh, I think when I started, I was 16, 17 years old. So um, wow. so yeah, uh, when when I look back, I'm 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 a bit impressed with myself for like uh, when I was 18, 19 years old and sticking it out with, uh, in particular, the third movie, which took. I think one and a one and a half years, and probably an average of two hours per day. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I was quite uh, diligent in, in actually getting it done. Uh, but I'm happy that I did. Definitely. Now, Martin, thank you so much for that sort of very broad strokes uh, retelling of of how it came about. Now. I know you guys, uh, Def Camp and Orkbit, you've probably got a bunch of questions. I've got a million questions that have just <laughs> basically just arisen from what I've heard there. So let me just start off with one, guys, and then I'll toss it over to you guys. Uh, Martin, just a couple of really, really quick ones, actually. One thing I wasn't sure about is um, what year did you actually um, start with? You said you obviously did a Guild movie beforehand. Now, what, what year did you do the Guild movie? And also, what year did you do Tales of the Past 1? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Tales of the Past one I can see was released in 2005, uh, at the end of 2005. And I think I probably did also the Guild movie and, and sort of the first steps at Machinima in, uh, in 2005 as well. Um, and then I can see that the third Tales of the Past was released in 2007 in December. So it's in that period that, uh, that I had sort of the intensive, uh, movie making. Okay. Now, Here's my big one, and then you guys go for it. Martin, it's so obvious as you watch through the series how much you improved as a creator and as an editor and, you know, everything, you know, the, the, the storytelling, the, the shots that you go with, the way in which you basically put together this production improves drastically as you go through one, two, and three. You know, you, you go so far as a, a storyteller. Can you sort of look back to where you started and how would you describe where you were at as a video maker, let's say around about, you know, that guild video or Tales of the Past One as compared to where you wound up towards the end of Tales of the Past Three? Yeah, I think, I think a, a lot, a lot happens in that period. Um, I think in the very start, uh, my ambition level was not that high. I think that, uh, that, that puts a lot of, uh, of, because I think, of course, I developed through that period, but I think it, the first stuff was just, you know, let's try this out for fun. And uh, and since there were, were no expectations to the movies, um, I also uh, felt, you know, I can do whatever uh, I want uh, and, and just sort of uh, relax around it. Then I think when I moved into the, the second and the third movie, um, I was also starting to take up a, a lot of people's time, so both the voice actors and uh, a lot of my own time, uh, but also uh, a lot of the people that actually participate in the movies do uh, spend significant time 
doing so. Um, so I think my, my, my general ambition level in order to produce a proper output from all of this increased drastically through, uh, through that period. But I think also uh, I, I did a bit of, you know, light research on, on how do you do a good storyline and, and did a bit of research on the right tools to use if you want to step up on the visual production. Uh, so I think a major step uh, between the movies is, which, which is also quite evident if you, if you watch them in Tales of the Past one and two, um, everything is recorded in game, uh, which I think has a, a certain charm to it. Uh, so, so, you know, the people you see, uh, are all, uh, other players, uh, acting, uh, within those scenes. So there is no sort of cheating and, um, and in many ways, it's similar to how you in, in real life would do uh, movies with uh, with real life actors. And in the third movie, I think um, in order to to facilitate uh, the vision I had for what that movie should look like and the kind of scene scenes and fight scenes I wanted, I, uh, I essentially had to say, you know, 50% is, is live with uh, real players actually acting in the movie and 50% is green screen, just like you would see in, in modern movies. Um, and it has pros and cons. Uh, you don't get the same, you know, experience as you get with actually working with people in the game where things are unpredictable. Uh, but it does yield the advantage that you can tell the exact story you like. You can tell it with the exact visuals down to choosing, you know, what kind of color schemes could a particular scene have. Um, so it gives you a, an artistic freedom that you don't have when you produce everything in game. So, so I think the tools changed and uh, my ambition changed and, uh, and just my experience changed. I came into this having zero experience with movie making mm. in the start. Wow. Okay. Def Camp, I'll throw wow. it over to you. And what we might, tr- what we might <laughs> try you. to do is, um, I know you don't feel bound by this, guys, but as much as we can, we might go through it chronologically and start with Tales of the Past One and just work our way through one, two, and three. So Def Camp or Orkbit, do either of you guys have a question regarding Tales of the Past One? I think Def Camp should go first. I need to change my pants. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> this is I just, wonderful hearing the whole thing. It is, man. I just, I just want to say first and foremost, Martin, I got to say thank you, dude, because I, first of all, I had no idea how much, I mean, I, I realized that a lot of time and effort went into this, but from you talking, I, I just don't, didn't realize just how much the years that you put into this. And I can't tell you how many Tuesdays, how many reset days I spent watching tales of the past over and over and over again. So first of all, thank you so much, dude. But I guess my question, it, it kind of, it's, it's kind of an overlapping question for all of them. And it does got to do with tales of the past one, which that end battle scene, I was talking about you beforehand, that end battle scene, it, it's, it's so important to me because it, it reminded me of one of my best moments in wow, where, where, when I first played Alliance, we attacked Urgamar, but um, you kind of can tell that the, Alliance, um, is, you know, where I guess your, uh, your guild was alliance, all that. But you kind of get this overarching story, uh, story at the end of it and throughout all the tales of the past where the alliance and the horde kind of join together and join voices together. But were you always an alliance player? And that was that something that you, uh, felt more connected or, but I also feel like I know how you kind of intertwine both of them. So is it, some, do you like both factions? Are you more for the Alliance? Are you more for the Horde? And how much of an impact did that have creating the, uh, the shows? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I only ever uh, played, uh, played Alliance, uh, in the game. Um, but, uh, but I think a lot of the, the things I took into the storyline, uh, there, there were two sources of inspiration. Uh, there were, I played, uh, the Warcraft games before, uh, and I, mm-hmm. I think a big inspiration in terms of, of doing a, all of this uh, was also the whole lore from those games I thought was great. Mm. Um, and you can say in, the, in those games, you play both sides and, uh, and you, you get both perspectives. And that was something right. I wanted to bring into this as well. Um, I think the bit, the second source of inspiration was that, uh, since this started out as a very, you can say local project, uh, it was a, a server specific project to the, uh, to the community that, that I was part of in, in the game at that time. And one of the things that I think was special about this game, uh, was the whole social side that was in particular present in the, in the start of the game, I felt, uh, where you had a lot of interaction between guilds. You had, uh, you, you can say a law that was built up in the game by the players across mm. uh, forums and uh, in-game communication. 
and uh, and you actually had these uh, you could say mythos or, or sort of uh, personalities uh, that would arise in the game mm. and and you can say a lot of the uh, the the characters you see in the movies in particular in in tales of the past 1 and 2 uh, they are inspired by by the in-game in-game uh, counterparts so for instance the the leaders of the of the horde side would be uh, you can say actually inspired by the characters that would be playing those uh, those characters in the game uh, and that's also why I see a lot of the characters have their in game names so Fencer, Blazer, Yemo, all of those are, are the original players uh, from uh, many of them from my guild uh, but also many of them from uh, just the server in general uh, so I think that that was a that was sort of the the thinking going into it uh, when when creating those original scenes. Oh, wow, you should see the smile on my face right now. <laughs> <laughs> I that that hearing that was I mean I, the fact that you incorporated the actual social aspect of your server into these you know movies is is just so purely vanilla wow and. That is amazing. Thank, that is the best answer I could have ever, ever gotten. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Orkbeard, over to you, man. What do you want to start out with? I don't know. I just think it's really beautiful that you can, like, that this got created, as you said, like, for your server. Like, you, like, nowadays, of course, you have so many types of media production, which, uh, you know, you can make YouTube channels or whatever and, and make videos for the rest of the world to see, but the drive or the motivation here that you chose to make this as it like a community project think i think that's the reason why it is so good as it is because it as def camp said like it's just so vanilla to make something like this and you can't fake it it's, it's, i don't know it's it's just cool <laughs> fair enough <laughs> martin i'll ask a quick one and because obviously you know tales of the past two and three is really where people's you know sort of they're the two that people talk about more when they talk about the series. But I've just got one quick one about Tales of the Past One. Now, Tales of the Past One, um, remind me, please, that's the one without voice acting. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. What were the, um, what were the challenges of trying to, you know, I don't know if you perhaps wanted to do voice acting, but just didn't have the facilities to do it at that point in time. What was it like trying to create that story just bound by text? Yeah, I, th- I think uh, I think when, when I went into these movies, uh, then one of one of the things I like to do, uh, which probably comes through f- throughout the whole trilogy, um, I would have specific scenes in mind with specific music in mind that uh, that I wanted to put together, and I would have a vision of how a, a specific scene, scene should look like. Um, and typically, it would be be taken outside in the music to start with. Uh, so I think. In Tales of the Past, one a good example of that is uh, there's this uh, Paris of the Caribbean music uh, soundtrack <laughs> when they gather uh, near the end, um, which you can say, I, I think that was probably sort of half the motivation for me doing the entire movie was just building up to that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in many ways, uh, that, that goes through all of the movies that, that it's like a chain connecting different scenes or different moments that I wanted to create uh, as a combination of visuals and and the music uh, underscoring those scenes. So you can say in the start, in the first one, it wasn't such a big issue for me that there was no voice acting because I felt, you know, that was secondary to the uh, to, to the having fun with uh, putting together uh, uh, music and, and scenes uh, in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. But but I also noticed that, you know, if, if or it was a realization afterwards, I got some feedback on it that uh, the people that were missing the voice acting, I thought it would be nice as an addition to it. And, and I had the same uh, perspective that if, if this needed to go to the second stage, then uh, that, that was a requirement. But it was a technical challenge because, you know, I, I couldn't sit with a Danish accent and sound like a 16-year-old uh, boy <laughs> and, 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 you know, record those uh, character uh, voiceovers. It just wouldn't work. And uh, and getting people with proper microphone quality was also difficult uh, back then. And it also does show in, in both the second and third movie where we do use uh, people from the actual server we played on uh, with voice acting, a lot of them. And and that was a challenge on on the the whole quality part. Um, but yeah, it was simply a a, a restriction on on the first one that uh, that uh, that we didn't have it. Well, can I ask you who did Thrall? 
Yeah, so Thrall, uh, the voice acting for Thrall, and, and I think it's the same guy. Uh, I would just have to go and check uh, his name, which is a bit embarrassing that I don't know it, uh, but it is in the end credits. If you go uh, and actually see the movie end credits of Tales of the Past, uh, you'll find there, there's a full list, and you'll find that we I use the same voice actors for a lot of them. Uh, so, um, so basically, uh, I think it was... Let me just check here. And there's Nightwish it. playing... Yes, there is Nightwish playing in the in those end yeah. credits. <laughs> um, the thing, the play, the Every person who, uh, who did a uh, role actually did, I think, like eight different characters in the in the third movie, and uh, and this is where I found some people that I've that I felt had actually you know uh, professional voice acting uh, quality and experiences and also equipment uh, for for doing mm. this. So yeah, uh, he sounded uh, like legit. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think uh, he's been doing a lot of uh, voice acting work both before and and after. I, I actually found out that he's a bit of a, uh, a figure within, I think, uh, a lot of communities online. So a lot of people on uh, oh, YouTube wow. will recognize him. Yeah, so so the Thrall and Rexa and Lothar and Doomhammer and Forsaken Rogue and a lot of <laughs> other characters are voiced yeah. by a guy called uh, Matt Greenberg. Um, so so he's been doing like a, a whole. A whole range of different characters in the movie. Uh, so, so I think that was beneficial for me that I found some voice actors that uh, that were quite versatile, so they could do a lot right. of different uh, styles uh, in those uh, in that third movie. I just realized now, having seen sort of some of the credits, um, did you get? You talked about some of the voice actors you got. You've got um, Guar and and some of the characters voiced by Jesse Cox. Is that Jesse Cox? Yeah. Jesse Cox. <laughs> Yeah, it was actually Jesse Cox that I wanted to mention that uh, that I, I saw his name. Uh, to to be honest, I don't actually know what where where it is that people know him from uh, because I honestly can't remember where I found him originally. But but maybe you can uh, enlighten me. No, that's I mean I have no idea what he would have been doing all those years ago. Obviously, he's very well known now. But I was just surprised going like that. I mean, again, what what year? Sorry, was Tales of the Past three? Yeah, that was two thousand and seven. That's still like, yeah, that's a long wow. time ago. 12 years ago. I have, a, it's just so bizarre to see that name going like, wow. But that is um, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. What has he been, been doing? Uh, what has he been yeah. doing since then? Uh, uh, Jesse's a really big YouTuber now and, um, almost he's, a million. Yeah. Almost a million yeah. subscribers on YouTube. He's a huge gaming personality, very, very well known in the gaming world. So, um, that, yeah. that's really interesting to see sort of. What he was doing 12 years ago, chiming in on this project. So very, very funny. I'll have to uh, chase that up somehow. But anyway, Martin, yeah. another thing you guys mentioned. Um, yeah, it's one thing that grabs me, the voice of Thrall. The person who played Thrall went in the direction of... Now, I didn't, I didn't mind it at all. They'd sort of played Thrall as a very well-spoken, just almost like a voice you'd hear on the street, as opposed to going for that gravelly, orcish kind of drawl that you might get. But it really worked yeah. for me. Did it, I, I'm sure it probably worked for a lot of people as well. I think uh, I think uh, I actually uh, saw uh, some clips. I haven't seen the full movie, to, uh, to be uh, brutally honest, but but uh, I saw uh, a few clips from the Warcraft movie, uh, the sort of the, the live-action movie that was done. And uh, and I noticed that uh, that for a lot of the the orcish characters, they did go for a very sort of uh, potato in mouth uh, kind of sound <laughs> to, I guess, uh, sort of replicate the how it would sound if you have two big horns sticking out of your mouth. Uh, <laughs> so so I think from a realism perspective and from from how uh, how these uh, figures sound in game uh, to some extent and in some in some of the law, it would make sense to have made it more growly. Um, but I think. In 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 the in the movie, I wanted it to not be too distracting. Uh, so so there, there were two aspects to it. Uh, one was microphone quality. So if you go for the more Crowley uh, voice, you also get you know more stuttering and different or sort of uh, different weird noises in the microphone. It's hard to capture that uh, properly. And wow. I think the second one was that if if you don't have you know super high uh, quality uh, both scripting and, and voice actors and and set up for doing this, I think it can quickly become very candy if you have the Crowley, uh, Crowley voice. Uh, all, all of these voice actors uh, were doing these lines under, you can say, remote directions. So I would send emails with, you know, the script and uh, and try my best to indicate, you know, what is the context. And in some cases, I would be, you know, on uh, whatever it was, Skype or Ventrilo or whatever back then, 
trying to sort of, you know, guide as best possible the, the voice actors. But we never had a studio or any sort of a joint location mm. where we were doing this. So, uh, so there was also a bit of limitation on, on how much I could, uh, could guide it. Okay. Hmm. Martin, we'll kick off to Tales of the Past 2. And, guys, I'll get you to think of any <laughs> Tales of the Past 2 related questions you've got after I just ask this initial one. Now, Martin, I, I, obviously we get the, the, the story of, you know, Yemo develops here. And, um, we, we, uh, that amazing scene for me on the bridge when they face off against, um, you know, the undead or the scourge and they end up jumping off the bridge. I think that's an amazing scene, but the story was sort of, it, it was great. It sung, it sung out to me. I really enjoyed it. What can you tell us about the story writing process for Tales of the Past 2? Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, to, to be honest, Josh, it's very, it's very long ago and I can't remember how. I would originally come up with, with sort of the different pieces to the story. The, I think the main sort of uh, thinking that went into it again was a bit, you know, I had some specific scenes in mind that I thought would be cool. So like the battle scene at the end, the army gathering, uh, the whole bridge scene that you mentioned, um, some of the initial intro scenes with, uh, with this, uh, there's this uh, night elf running on, a, on his mount uh, to the music and all that jazz. Those were scenes that I knew I wanted in the movie, uh, and then I needed an excuse in the storyline to put it together. Um, and then I think, luckily, it turned out to be, you know, not a complete mess uh, in the storyline, uh, but it was a bit sort of the, the structure that I would go through. So I would, you know, construct these individual scenes and then find out what could be the logical glue to put this together. Um, so I would have an overarching idea, but... A lot of the sort of in between the scenes was uh, was done a bit more, uh, you know, like glue, so to speak. <laughs> to be honest, at least for the for the second movie and and the wow. first. Mm. So first of all, I want to say uh, tells the best too. Guar is my favorite character. I didn't even know that it was Jesse Cox. I loved it, so that's that's so cool. But I love Guar, this ancient, you know, uh, Taran who just has this awesome knowledge. But so tells the past too. And we're talking a little bit about this uh, before the show is the first, and I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but it's the first time you see the Lich King, right? And, um, yeah. you know, he's this overarching, you know, baddie in, in, in the stories. And what really interests me is, looking back now, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, you put the Lich King in there and this big baddie before even we knew Wrath of the Lich King was going to be an expansion. Um, so was that something that, you know, it, it looks like you, you really love the Warcraft 3 storyline, you know, and having, you know, going down the story arc of the Ashbringer, um, you know, the, the Lich King, was that, did you know, um, you know, that, that this was the story you wanted to go through from Tales of the Past 1, or did that kind of evolve over time? I, it definitely was something that evolved over time, and I think it, it even evolved within the second movie, so the whole scene with the Ashbringer was uh, was something I came up with by by the end of constructing the second movie. Um, hmm. because I wanted some sort of tie-in to the next one. Uh, and I think I, I had this idea that I always liked the, the Arthas storyline from, from the games. And I wanted to, to sort of continue on that because I think at this point in time in the game in, in World of Warcraft, there hadn't been that much foreshadowing. There hadn't been any sort of real storyline done on the Lich King, uh, probably right. because they were, you know, saving it up for the expansion. <laughs> and I thought, uh, I thought, you know, why not, uh, why not give that a step and actually have some fun with it? Because it was, uh, to me, such an unexplored uh, storyline in a game that by this time had uh, been progressing for, for quite some time. Um, and, and I felt that, uh, that, uh, that that would be an interesting thing to, to go for. And then you can say it kind of went from there. So if I wanted to have a, a big bad from the actual, uh, actual original games come in, um, and I wanted that for a bit the shock effect uh, that you see also in the scene where Yimo discovers that it's the Lich King. You know, what kind of what kind of bad guy can you put in there that people actually know so you don't have to do a, a lot of character building, right. uh, but at the same time would make some sense in the, in the context of the story. And, uh, <laughs> and you can say that that sort of also inspires a lot of the subsequent uh, storytelling because, you know, if you have the Lich King being the, the number one bad guy, how are you going to be able to to challenge that uh, that character with any of mm. the characters in the story? And for me, that was then combined with the whole uh, Ashbringer law that had been conjured <laughs> up within the game, which was a, a fun theme at the time, like very mysterious. And, you know, is this weapon in the game? And, and is it there? Is it not there? Can you find it? 
um, there was this whole, uh, you know, you need to have a 999 fishing skill or whatever in order to right, find right. it in some specific <laughs> yeah, location. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I thought that was hilarious. And, and I thought, you know, again, this was an opportunity to, to bring something in that had a lot of, you know, unexplored territory and a lot of cool background law that was not <sighs> fully utilized. And I figured, you know, let's let's uh, mix those two things together and have the the Ashbringer fight the Lich King uh, by the end of the of the third movie. So that was sort of decided in the second movie. And looking back, it's uh, it's a bit uh, you know fun that uh, that this is, uh, and I guess that was always the plan from Blizzard, but that this yeah. is also the way it goes in in the actual the game. Uh, Dude, guess, you can uh, take some credit. I know. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Like, but I, to be fair, though, loves the Arthur storyline so much. You made Wrath of the Lich King so much better for me when it came out because of Tales of the Past. Like, it's amazing. Now, well, that's cool to hear. It's, um, I, I thought it was quite fun to see, you know, how, how it all turned out and how the Ashbringer in the, uh, in the expansion got such a, a prominent role uh, because I think up to until later it was really a niche, niche kind of thing, uh, that, that some people were, were reading about and, and not a lot. Mm. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was sort of the, the way that it intertwined. Too easy. That's crazy, though. Orkbit, did you have something to finish up on Tales of the Past 2 with? Um, well, it's more for the for the ending, to be honest. I think it's always been bugging me, but uh, <laughs> let's wait for that. Okay, too easy. All right, well, let's <laughs> let's get into it, Martin. Let's talk about Tales of the Past 3, you know, your your magnum opus. This is the work that, that everyone, you know, sort of does gravitate towards a little bit when they talk about this series. You mentioned it yeah. had, you know, you thought it had about a million um, downloads at some point. I think, I mean, on whatever WoW Wiki page I saw, it said, like, at one point it had 1.8 million downloads over at Warcraft movies. This was a very, very I popular think, I movie. Think the- I have the, the overview here on, on the Warcraft movies. And I think if you look at the Machinima tab, uh, in there, I think there, there is one movie. If you go to all movies and you, you know, sh- show, show the movies from all time mm. and, uh, and you then, uh, if you then filter by, by views, uh, you will see that, uh, that I'm nowhere near the number one, uh, which is Leroy Jenkins, which has, yeah. I think, 17 million, uh, million views. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I could do nothing about that. And, and, and I have to accept that, uh, that, that one is simply, uh, unreachable. But I think, uh, the Tales of the Past Three has, uh, 5.6 million views. And so it, it's a lot more commonly known and, and commonly viewed, uh, compared to the other ones, which I think have, uh, it's around uh, two or three uh, for the second one and, and one million for, uh, for the first one. Mm. And then there is a, a gazillion of, you know, clips and, and uh, various versions uploaded to YouTube of the third movie, mm. um, around. Oh, well, there you go. But, we'll have to, but, we'll have to update that article I read for sure. That's 5.6 million. That's yeah. fantastic. Well, look. That's amazing. Absolutely. This is such a huge project as you said you spent you know a, over a year working on it a year and a half or so i think you mentioned two hours a day um what made you want to make this effectively a feature-length movie i think i think it just kind of um it ended up that way uh, so so i had a specific story i wanted to tell uh, i wanted sufficient time to uh to bring the whole arc uh, around uh, the, the main character blazer one of the main characters i wanted to bring that uh sort of uh, full circle. Uh, so if he was going to be fighting, a uh, bit of spoilers here, but be fighting the, the Lich King in the end as the Ashbringer, <laughs> then essentially uh, there needed to be the right buildup for that. And, and mm. in my mind, I wanted to take the time to do that in order to not r- just rush into things. Um, and then I think at the same time, I felt, you know, if there is going to be a clash of this scale, then it it kind of needs to involve key characters uh, from from both the alliance and horde side because otherwise to me it just wouldn't make contextual sense you know why where where <laughs> where the fuck is frol and jane and all of those uh, if if not involved in this um, so so i kind of felt i had to tell a number of different stories uh, and and when i just put that uh, together in in writing uh, i think i ended up having a 90 page long script in in word uh, by the end of it and i could sort of see okay <laughs> where, where is this going i could see that this would uh, this would take uh, quite a bit of time to get through and, and it would take a probably a, you know a feature length uh, movie uh, before i was done with it uh, but i thought that was fine and, and I, I figured you know why not uh, why not take that challenge and see you know can i do it or, or can't i 
did you feel the need to obviously upping the scale of things? You know, some of the battle scenes you've got in Tales of the Past Three, you know, you've got a lot of players involved. Like, how did you, I know you had the guild's help and everything, but I'm shocked at how you got so much assistance with this. Like, talk about rounding up all these people. Like, was it like herding cats? Yeah, I think, I think actually by, by the end of the second one, uh, I had gotten some pretty good experience with, uh, with organizing players and, uh, and getting them to, to join in where we had this, uh, this big battle scene by the end of the second one. And I think that helped a lot also in, in getting players for the third one. And I think also by, uh, by that time, there was already a bit of a, a small fan community around the movies. So a lot of people would join the server, uh, that I was on to just participate in these particular scenes. And, uh, and I did a bit of marketing. You can actually go, if you go on Warcraft movies, there is a Tales of the Past free teaser, which, uh, which is where I, I explain, you know, we're going to record this movie. Uh, make sure you join. It's going to be awesome. And I think that also helped in, uh, in getting some people together. Um, but it's always a challenge working with real players. I mean, I, I can control, uh, how people act in game. And, uh, and we were recording not on a role playing server, but on a player versus player server. So, from time to time, uh, you can say recordings will still be obstructed by by also people, you know. Just like there are people that love the movies, there are also uh, people already at this time that, uh, that you know, with a passion hate the movies. So there would also be uh, be people that would come deliberately for these scenes to uh, to kill me and my player uh, in-game uh, to stop recordings. Because when, I, when I'm killed, I'm basically not able to move around uh, and, and do the camera. Mm. Um, so... Both by the end of the second movie and, and for generally through the third movie, we had to have, you know, these small uh, death patrols, we'll call them, which would be, you know, <laughs> two, two to four uh, so men, uh, squads that would be running around uh, in the sort of orbit of the, uh, of the movie scenes. Then they would be taking care of the rogues and whatever that would be trying to kill the, the main characters or, or me or, or, or jump around in the background. Wow. That's insane. That seriously, like. I, the the production value, and then this is back in two thousand six, seven ish, and you do all this stuff. It yeah. almost sounds like you have more to do than a than a film set. Well, you do have the same things on, <laughs> like you do on a film set, unless people here have magic and swords and shit. So, <laughs> damn, like you you have people patrolling your like your sets. So you I love film. it. That's crazy. Yeah, it's I love insane. it. It's like the, uh, the, the bouncers at the lot, like, you know, sort of the security <laughs> at the lot, keeping the spies from, uh, all the, the, the Twitter spies away from the film set. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, I wouldn't insane. have thought of that. Can, can I ask a question yeah. regarding some uh, production though? Like, yeah, um, on. cause like, were you doing this all, all by yourself in your free time? Yes. Uh, so, so I would be, you can say, I would have a, a couple of different roles. So I would be doing the, the script and, uh, and the editing and the recording, uh, and, and the whole sort of, you can say, organization of the whole thing. Um, so you can say in the, in the team that were contributing to this, then I would definitely count the voice actors that, uh, that took a, a large share also in, uh, in constructing the dialogue to some extent. So I would have an initial dialogue, but some of the voice actors, like in particular, the guy doing a uh, Blazer's dialogue would have a lot of, uh, of inputs, uh, to personalize their character a bit for their own style, which I, uh, which I thought was, uh, was quite cool. And, uh, and then you can That's say we, cool. I, I was working with many uh, people in the game. So again, Blazer and Yemo and all of these are, are their own counterparts in game. So I would be relying on, on them actually wanting to keep joining for for scenes uh, all the way through to uh, to the end of the movie um so so in that way there was a, a big team around it and i think counting how many people participated in total within the game it's uh, it's a thousand plus um but but i didn't have any sort of support on on the editing side because uh, it it was just a project yeah. i was doing for for friends oh my so god it, so like the the tools you had available back then would probably be like wow model viewer and then yeah then you did you have your own simulated server as well uh, like your own private server to do scenes on capture like b-roll yeah, stuff yeah i did, I, did a, I did have one third movie and, and the reason for it was uh, two things so for one i needed to do a couple of scenes uh, shot in game with custom uh, constructed models so i, I wanted the thrall that there is a scene in tales of the past three where thrall is walking with uh, with uh, what is his name now? His uh, so counterpart. Sorry. Yeah. So, 
yeah, something. And they're walking uh, around in Oakland. So uh, being alliance, that was a bit hard for me to record. And <laughs> the second thing was, uh, I needed, to, I needed to have, you know, two characters that look, uh, as close to, uh, to their actual look, uh, in the movie, which w- w- mm. obviously didn't exist with that particular gear. That's also why you see that Thrall has red eyes and that scene instead of blue eyes mm, is because it's yeah. recorded uh, in game, uh, with a character model that doesn't have blue eyes. Um, but that's still so, insane. Yeah, so so that that was a private server, and I, and I used that as well for for doing some fly around shots, uh, like for when I w- went to Nakramas for those final scenes with Arthas, that was also done on the private server. Um, but uh, but a lot of scenes were also still recorded in in the PvP server Doom Mall. That's amazing. Wow. And what That's... Like, <laughs> software did you use to edit in? Uh, Vegas? Yeah, or what I did used you have back then? Um, for for the free movies. I used Sony Vegas for putting together the clips. And then for the third movie, when I started constructing scenes in layers with like, you know, green screen model viewer shots together mm-hmm. with backgrounds, uh, I would be using Adobe Premiere, I think it was called. Um, yeah. So so there I would construct, you know, uh, each of these clips and then put it, put it together in Sony Vegas. So, you know, a, a five second clip of, a, of some intensive action scene that can easily take 10, 15 hours to construct uh, when you need to yeah. record, you know, Different pieces and the the effects and all of that stuff, putting it together. Uh, but that was done in, in those programs. Hmm. But that's like I don't know if it's only for me. I think it can resonate with uh, the others in the, in uh, the call as well. But from from anyone who has done any video game uh, editing <laughs> or like like video game videos of any sort, and look back and add ten years of you know technology being reversed like back to the state of (laughs) mid 2000 video editing. I I couldn't imagine. No, I I mean, it still holds up today and it it just, I just think it's crazy how, how you produced this back then. I mean, even with the tools we have today, obviously we have some amazing people creating, uh, awesome machinima and everything like that, but nothing has ever, you know, nothing has ever came close to this with the whole, you know, story and everything. And just like the reason why I'm interested in if you did, everything by yourself is like artistic choices like you did the qual voice you you lowered the frequency or somehow uh uh slowed down the clip to to make his voice deeper or something like that like did it come from you or, or did you get the voice acting clip like that did you put small little uh, like yeah artistic I, I, would, choices I would put that, uh, that together so, so i would get the raw voice acting clips and then I would play around with the sound uh and and doing the, the whole sound design i was quite uh sort of deliberate about um i think you can also see it very clearly probably in in one of the scenes with uh, blazer and office in the end of the movie where they're standing off uh, against each other and and i had a very sort of particular view on how those lines uh, needed to be spoken um and and you know how the whole uh, background sound I, I think i got like a huge sound library from somewhere uh hopefully legally but with a lot of, you know, different, uh, different, uh, cool, uh, you know, explosion sounds or whatever it might be that helped a lot. Uh, so combining that with, you know, slowing down voices, adding the bass, uh, different things yeah. to, to make it click, uh, was also a big part of, of the movie. And I think for me, replayability was probably a, a key thing mm. going into the, the third one that I wanted to create scenes that I would myself want to watch over and over again. Um, yeah. because, you know, they, they should have high production value per, per second and they should have, you know, something that, that gets you back there. So like a scene that you like or whatever it was. Um, and that was also <laughs> why I would create, you know, some, some deliberate choices that, uh, that I think when you look at YouTube comments today on some of these clips, you'll see that, uh, that they're fairly divisive uh, in the third movie. So you have people like you guys that, that really like this stuff. And I think that's, uh, that's probably the majority. But you also yeah, get people absolutely. that have, you know, some very, very <laughs> extremely strong opinions about that's this work. Anything, and, uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, anything. anything. Yeah. And, that, and, and I think that's the also just the, uh, the, the YouTube uh, community culture. Uh, so for, uh, for today, I just look at it. I think it's, it's always hilarious. Uh, I get a good laugh of, of reading some of these comments. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I think, I think I would rather create work that, uh, that divides a bit, uh, but have some people that actually really, really like this stuff. Mm. Um, exactly. So, Martin, I'd love to know. You mentioned obviously we're, we're looking back on a lot of this stuff all these years later. Uh, are you still involved with WoW at all? And and do you mm. go back and watch any Machinima at all these days out of interest? 
I, I don't uh, I don't play the game uh, anymore. So you can say uh, the the reason why I did these movies was at uh, start. You know, like like many others, I spent quite a lot of time in this game, and uh, I was uh, I was about to leave, and I felt you know a bit. Uh, what kind of achievement have I gotten out of, uh, of of spending all those hours in the game, um, and wanting something a bit more tangible than than a character that was, you know, not necessarily having any direct value down the line. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to create something out of it. Uh, so so when I was sort of done with the with the third movie, that was also uh, you can say my goodbye to to the game. Um, mm. I did come back for for a few short movies that I think you can find on YouTube, like uh, Divided Soul and and uh, and one other one, um, but but I never I never sort of really got into uh, the game again. Uh, I played a bit of the expansion with Wrath of the Lich King, and, and it was great fun. But uh, but I also started having less time. So when I finished the third movie, I was uh, just I just started at college, uh, studying economy, uh, as boring as as that sound. Um, and and I felt you know if I was going to take that seriously, I couldn't have you know a side project uh, taking up two three hours per day uh, every day. Uh, it would also you know uh, yeah. I met my girlfriend at that point in time, and and there were sort of limits to uh, to the level of understanding on <laughs> spending yeah. that amount of time on, on something oh, that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so that was, that was a decision. It is just in back then. Yeah. But what wow. I, what I have done is uh, I have been keeping a bit of tabs on you know what has been the development within the whole machinima genre uh, within the game, and and also been looking at a lot of the stuff that uh, that Blizzard have created in terms of of their cinematics, which have improved mm. substantially through uh, through uh, through the time. And some of the most recent stuff, I think, is is really impressive. Yeah. Uh, so it's of course not a one-to-one comparison, but I think it's quite fun to just follow a bit mm-hmm. along. You know what kind of techno- technological shifts have, uh, have come in mm-hmm. the meantime. Right, mate. I completely understand what it's like to balance a girlfriend and something that takes a couple of <laughs> hours a day as well. <laughs> Trust me, <laughs> Def Camp. You, you sound like you've got something. Let's yeah. let's sort of get I, to I our. I just want to say I, I I have to say this before you know we close, and and I just want to say, Martin. Um, you know, if you ever do play to plan on playing classic, please hit me up. We, We'd love to have you uh, in our guild or anything, yeah. but <laughs> I just want to say, man, um, you know, I, looking back and, and doing mission myself, uh, like trying it a little bit here and there, you know, taking hours upon days into a 10 minute clip and realizing you did an hour and a half for, you know, tells of the past three. It's just unbelievable how much uh, effort and work you put into it. And I just wanted to tell you, man, that you changed and made so many people's wow experience better because of your, of what you did. Um, you know, for me, the social aspect of the game is my favorite aspect of the game. And what you did creating this, bringing people together, that's in essence what Vanilla WoW and Classic WoW is all about for me, right? And, um, you know, you made my experience that much better to every time I logged in to think about my character. If I made a paladin, you know, think about the Ashbringer and do all these things. It just it just brought so many of us together. You know, Orkman and I were talking about Tales of the Past and, yeah, that's just that's what Vanilla WoW is all about, man. It's about the community you coming together. Shit. Exactly, and you literally made my experience that much better, brother. And and I can't thank you enough, man. I just can't. Well, that's uh, that's fantastic to hear. I'm really happy. I I just created this stuff originally for for my own, you know, challenging myself and having some fun with it. So I think it's amazing to hear that that other people actually really like it to the sixth. And I I don't think I ever sort of. Had that uh, that part of uh, in mind or as a, as an ambition when creating this, so uh, so that's awesome. Thanks a lot. Orc bit anything no closing up for Martin? Yeah. So yeah, I actually had a question in regards to like the lore in the movie or like something like that. Just something that because we, we briefly touched upon how you know Raph wasn't out or even announced back mm-hmm. then, yet you you know you. First of all, you put Arthas in, great with the Dreadnought and everything. Uh, I know probably <laughs> some people would be like, uh, it's not his real armor. Well, he didn't fucking <laughs> yes. have his own guy. I've, seen, I've yeah. seen comments like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people don't get it. So, so I literally fuck, fuck, that, fuck yeah. that shit. But like, towards the ending, um, when, when, uh, this, let's just say spirit entity, it's like we had a deal and then Frostmourne is back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of feel like we've, we had no real answer spoilers. I, I yeah, have yeah, to yeah. ask this. This it's is more than one the lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So obviously you didn't have uh, any sort of uh, spirit of an orc or something, but is it to be assumed that the spirit at the end, like, is that Nisul? 
Yeah, I think that was the, uh, the I think I, I made it uh, deliberately to have a, a bit of an open interpretation on that. So mm. you say one, one interpretation is that, uh, that that is the case that is national uh, coming back. You say. Um, so, so that was <laughs> that was uh, one angle to it. I think the other angle that uh, that I played around with a bit and I had to be honest, I can't say which one I ended up with. But uh, I think uh, at this time there were these, uh, which the model is also uh, uh, matching. There were these entities in the game uh, playing some sort of role in, I think, the Burning Legion expansion, uh, and mm-hmm. there were these you know, good guys that uh, that were mysterious and blah blah blah. And again, I think yeah. I took this element from the game where there was some sort of discussion and and some light uh, foreshadowing that perhaps these entities were not uh, necessarily good guys uh, and were sort of uh, playing some strings behind the scenes. So I figured, you know, that might be a storyline that Blizzard would pick up on at a later stage. So, so why not play around with the idea, you know, that, uh, that we had a bit of foreshadowing within the movie and that they were uh, sort of pulling the strings behind the scenes, uh, even behind the Lich King. Uh, so that was sort of the other, uh, other story I played with in case I wanted to go back and create a, a fourth movie or something like that. Mm. It's pretty cool though. Cause I don't think at that yeah. point, I don't, I don't know if. I, I never really, you know, read all the Warcraft books and all that stuff. But to my knowledge, the, like the book with Arthas and stuff first came out after Wrath, right? Like years later where, you know, you get the whole Arthas and Nisul are fused together or are they? And then in Wrath, you see this little boy inside, uh, the Citadel, which is like, is that a part of Arthas and everything? And like, mm. it just seems like you already did it. Like, you know, Simpsons. I know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Martin did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I've always been like, wait, did I just not like, did that stuff? Cause I, I have not, I didn't check when the books came out and stuff, but I don't think. No, I think, I think, out. I think the only, the only information that was really on, on that story was from the ending of Walker Free. Walker uh, Free, yeah. And, yeah, where you, where you have them, uh, them merging together. And, and I don't think you, you learn much more from that. So I think I, it was just inspired from that. And, uh, and again, a bit of unexplored territory in the storyline of the games uh, that I thought was nice to, to expand a bit upon. And, and again, it's just interesting to see that, uh, that Blizzard probably had the same idea. Um, but uh, that's the thing just, though. Like did they, or did they see your shit and be like, That's yeah, who knows? Who I, knows? Think, I think they saw it. I think, they, I think it's I, definitely, uh, 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 definitely a chance that they were, you know, slightly maneuvered by your work. I yeah. think so. Absolutely. Did you ever get I mean, contacted seriously. by them, but Martin? No, I think, I think definitely I would assume that given Blizzard has a pretty big team and given that the movies have been seen by, by so many, such, so if you compare the share, uh, seeing the movies versus the share of, of overall players, at that time being, you know, 10 million or something, then I think, uh, I think definitely they must have known that it exists, but I've never been formally contacted by them. And I think the reason either they, they just don't do that, but also you can say the movies do utilize music that have been, uh, mm. say, from other movies that yeah. are not necessarily right. strictly speaking legal to use uh, and definitely not to monetize from. Um, yeah. And I think, Perhaps Blizzard would want to not show that they in any way sort of uh, encourage this kind of thing, uh, even if uh, mm-hmm. it's probably good PR for them. But, you know, they, they wouldn't want to get stuck in something like that. Uh, yeah, that's a good so, point. So, yeah. so I think they, they need to keep these uh, machinimas in general at arm's length from, from a legal perspective. That would at least be my assumption. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. Because you don't get it, like, in Warcraft 3, you don't really get the feel that Nisul and Arthas are still like, yeah, you can split whenever kind of feel. But, but when you brought the whole, we had a deal thing and they could like go back and then Blizzard shows us that they're still a part of, uh, Arthas and stuff. And it's just really and, cool. Yeah. And the way you ended it, Martin, I, the, the, I mean, it was perfect. Like the ending and I'm not going to give it anything away, but I like a lot of times you see something like the ending, like, Oh, what the hell? This ending. For me, I loved it. It was perfect, <laughs> especially the very, very end. Like it was so cool. And mm-hmm. dude, I just got to say, I mean, if you ever plan on making anything again, uh, it's just, uh, you know, if you need a voice actor, I'm here or Chris here. I'm sorry. You would love to do it. Um, I can play a little girl. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah we've, have I, we got I, I the girls work, for you on this call, man? We've got the ladies. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, very oh, good. Be amazing. <laughs> Martin, it would. It would be true, true. I just yeah. want to say thank you so much again for agreeing to do this. It's been a, a kick. I've gotten a kick out of um, getting to talk to you, but I can tell you who's gotten a bigger kick out of it, these two guys on the other line. Yeah, so absolutely. thanks so much. <laughs> no worries, guys. Yeah. It was super fun to, to join this uh, and uh, – and really appreciate the uh, the nice comments and uh, and talking with you guys. Well, Our pleasure, I gotta man. tell you how much I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it so much. Thank yeah. you, Martin, and thank you, Josh. But Martin, you know, you you've made uh, a little girl's dream come true today. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Def Camp, and thanks so much, Orkbeard. Right. Thanks for tuning. Thanks for uh, nice joining day, in, mate. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. See you. Yep. Bye. Okay, it's time for another countdown to Classic Call, and we've got Sneaky Bard on the line. Is that right? Is it Sneaky Bard? I. that's right. That's Sneaky Bard. That's me. Okay. You also go by Kishmit. Is that right? Yes. Uh, well, that used to be my WoW handle back in the day. Uh, nowadays, it's changed. Like People change names, I guess, uh, as they grow Absolutely. I mean, that, that's the beauty of it. Although I had, um, I had listener, uh, Far Q on the show recently who laughed that they made that name when they were 17 years old, but they're sticking to their guns and, and keeping with it. Who, he'll actually be back on the show soon to talk about priests, but I got a, I got a kick out of that, that, you know, obviously some people pick their names when they're very young and very different people and, and still stick to them. But, Sneaky Bard, you're here because you mentioned something in the Discord a few days ago that um, grabbed my interest, and I'll just read back what you said sort of verbatim so that everyone can catch up if people didn't see your comment at the time. And you said the following, Does anyone have the feeling that the more they play classic or vanilla, specifically the leveling bits, and the better that they get, the more it takes some of the magic out of it? I've run the Undead Sailor Curse quest in Westfall up to 10 times over the years, but only now do I realize there's a shortcut to one of the captains with the key. So instead of using all my consumables and and uh, kiting to, to get through the entire ship to him, oh, sorry, sorry, all my consumables and kit to get through the entire ship to him, now I know how to completely diffuse the challenge of that particular quest. Sorry, the wetlands, not Westfall. I, I, I mucked that up. You corrected that later on. Yes, the wetlands. Now, it brings up sort of a larger point here where we talk about, yeah, we're generally dealing with people who obviously listen to this podcast who have played the game a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot, a lot. Like, people know this game inside and out. I'm amazed by the people that know a lot of the quests inside and out. You can just rattle off the name of the quests and they go, oh, yeah, you got to go speak to this person. you got to go to this location on the grid, blah, 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 do this, do that. So talk to me about how some of the magic of the knowledge that you've, sorry, yeah, some of the knowledge you've obtained over the years has taken away from a bit of the magic of Vanilla WoW. All right, yeah, so uh, I will focus on the specifically the leveling bit because that's also what I, like, talked about on the Discord. And mainly what it boils down to is that there's a uh, suspension of disbelief that ends up happening, uh, specifically for certain bits where it seems that it is the design of either the area or the quest that is set up in such a way that you as a player are presented with a problem but then something goes wrong and you need to suspend disbelief because you can either bypass that problem completely or it's just not relevant what the game is presenting to you as a problem. So as a like very simple example of this, for instance, is something where you have elite mobs guarding, say, an item that you need to get. Uh, this is, for instance, a case in Duskwood when you need to go to Jorgen's Farmstead and get the... Uh, like part of the journal that uh, Jitters has buried into a dirt mound there. Mm-hmm. And there's a elite defias mage there. So immediately as a leveler, when you see elite mobs, you're thinking, okay, I can't take this on at level unless I'm like really good, which I'm not. But since this is a mage, even as a class that doesn't have CC like a sap or polymorph, what you can do is you can go to the dirt mound and click on it the mage will queue up a fireball and that fireball will actually go off by the time you have picked up or opened up the dirt mount. So you can 
get the item and you will be hit by one fireball. But essentially that mob doesn't play any role at all. It's just standing there to deal one fireball's worth of damage. Okay. Well, when you talk about obviously bumping into things that you weren't expecting, it's a great example with the, the Defias mob that you bump into. But, I mean, I sort of equate it to movies in a way. Obviously, people know that I'm a big film fan as well. And, you know, we go back, we watch classic movies that we love, that we've seen a million times. You know, it might be a horror film. It might be, you know, whatever. Like I think of an example like Jaws. I love Jaws. Um, I've seen it a million times. It's one of my favorite films of all time. I know all the precise moments where the jump scares are coming, where the suspense is built and where something unexpected is thrown upon us by Spielberg. But I still get a really great sense of enjoyment out of it. And I guess I won't lie. I probably still do like a mild little jump at certain portions. Um, do you still get that feeling when you've done these quests a million times? Do you... Even though you you know what to expect and you might have worked out a few shortcuts here and there, do you still get that level of delight out of completing them or not so much? There's definitely some quests where I do. So these are mainly the quests where the suspension of disbelief happens due to, say, a weakness in the game system itself. So say something like the AI. So one of your fundamental leveling tools, for instance, is if you're not calm, comfortable dealing with two or three mobs at the same time. What happens, at least on Kronos, where I play, is uh, you can just like do a ranged pull on one of the mobs and start running backwards, and uh, all of the other mobs you've pulled will disengage from the fight one by one until you're only left with one of these mobs, and that's essentially how you do one-on-one pulls. And you can do this with groups of mobs that by the way the world presents them to you, should act as a cohesive unit. So say the Forsaken career in Arathi Highlands, you can do that. You can kill all the bodyguards one by one until you only have the courier left. Now, that isn't, like, I still get enjoyment out of that because that is a tactic I still need to employ, even though it feels kind of like I'm cheesing it. But in case of the West uh, Wetlands Undead quest, I just, I didn't get any enjoyment out of killing the captain. I got enjoyment out of figuring out I can do it much quicker this way, but the point of getting to the captain and killing him, it was kind of like, nah, this is just like too easy. Hmm. It's, I mean, you bring up the great concept of cheesing and I'm just sort of sitting here thinking, you know, the, the, not conundrum, but the issues that it raises in terms of, as you say, we, we've all gotten better as players. Our skill level and our knowledge base has risen over the years. And we see a group of mobs now and we know how to sort of tactically take them down solo and pull one at a time. Whereas back in days gone by, we may have just charged in to our gruesome deaths and learnt our lesson that way. But mm-hmm. there are still certain mobs that you know, and in quests and things like that that do get cheesed by a lot of classes. How do you feel about cheesing in general? I guess I'd say in World of Warcraft and in games in general. Uh, I think it's a fully legitimate tactic. And like what gets my suspension of disbelief essentially triggered is when I notice that it doesn't matter what class I'm playing is. I can do this and I don't have to use any of the special abilities that that class brings to the table in order to pull this off. So say one really great quest that I have no trouble with like cheating or cheesing through is the what the flux questing here in Gorge. So there you need to go down into the tunnels where you have a bunch of dark iron dwarves and get the flux plants uh, that are on a table guarded by two elite mobs. Now, as a mage, for instance, what you can do is you pull him off one of the mobs, namely the caster, and the melee will start running towards you. Then you'll frost Nova, that guy, blink, so you're almost at the table, and then you just hit that open the scroll button. And by the time you pick up the scroll, the melee guy is back hitting you, but will not be able to interrupt your opening uh, the scroll uh, activity, whatever if you want to call that. So that for me, it's clearly cheesing, but I need to use specific tools that only the mage class has to do that. Now I can figure out how to do this as a rogue say, but I have no idea. Like I have ideas how to do it on a warrior, but I 
don't know if they would work. And even if they would work, it would require me to sort of think about what can a warrior do in this situation to do it. But the Unled quest in the wetlands is essentially just seeing, oh, I can walk up here and bypass all the mobs to get to the target I need to. Hmm. It's um. I agree with you that it's definitely legitimate, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm shitting on cheesing or anything. I mean, God, I do it as well. But um, I mean, I've done it as recently as you know. I remember I was playing God of War a few weeks ago for the first time, and even something like that, where you know you come across these huge giants in the early portions of the game, and I'm not sure if you play God of War, but you can you know you can run in and hack and slash away and sort of for me because i'm not the greatest gamer in the world die a horrible death many times over or i worked out hang on they've put this ability in the game where i can just sit back at range distance and just you know throw my weapon at him time after time after time and as i was doing that and eventually winning these battles that way just sort of chipping away very very slowly at at the mob's health i just feel like i know this is effective this is a tactic this is a gamer using his brain and all that jazz but it felt so wrong. <laughs> and I, I mean, it does feel wrong, but at least the part of me that enjoys figuring out the puzzle of how to do it goes, okay, I figured it out and I had to actually analyze what are my tools and what's the challenge here. So then I can go like, well, at least I did something. I had to play. Hmm. Are there any other instances that you can think of through Vanilla World of Warcraft where you really do wish that you could sort of extract that memory from yourself and go in with a fresh set of eyes? Uh, oh, yes. So there's a couple of quests that are related to area design where there's a, um, I'll call it a flaw, but that sounds slightly too negative, but essentially the area is designed in such a way that the challenge can be overcome much easier than projected. So say the Hogger quest is a great example of this. So when you get the quest, you're essentially uh, as far away from Hogger as possible because you have to walk through all the uh, knolls in order to get to him if you're going like on a straight path as most levelers would. But if you're circling around and approaching Hogger from Westfall, you can just ignore all the knolls and you can probably even manage to pull a Hogger like one-on-one without having to worry about any patrols or respawns or any of that sort of stuff. So that's kind of where I'm like, "Mm, the area where Hogger is might have been able to be designed slightly better. Mm. But as a huge fan of stealth games, I also understand that these types of things are great to have in games because it just, you know, you have to have some form of uh, awareness of the area that you're fighting in or that you need to get to and you can solve puzzles that way but it felt slightly a bit too easy you have a a similar thing happen in the night elf starting area where you have to kill lord melanus a satyr who's in a cave system that's part of the twisted hatred quest and there's a pool in that cave and if you're uh, in that pool any mob you pull will automatically disengage from you. This uh, happened, for instance, to me in TBC. I haven't tried it in vanilla yet, so it might be something that was wonky in TBC and doesn't affect vanilla. But that way you can essentially just keep pulling mobs really haphazardly without having to worry about how you do the pull as long as you walk back into the pool and then they will disengage. And that just that takes a tactic, even if it's minimal tactical awareness that you need for pulling, it just completely nullifies that. Mm. It's a great point regarding sort of geographical knowledge in general because so many of us know this map so well. Like I have no doubt that a vast majority of people listening to this show could sit down with a blank piece of paper and draw you the map fully labelled of Azeroth and just be like, this is here, this is there, and probably with level ranges and all that jazz just going, we know this place, we know this world. And I keep going coming back to the fact was when, when you talk about things that have maybe – dropped the level of immersion a little or at least just removed a little bit of that magic from the game it's my knowledge of the world i wish i could take that away and just go in empty again because 
nothing will replace that feeling of, you know, walking into certain zones. Like um, I equate it to, you know, walking into Duskwood for the first time. And just if you come in from Elwyn and watching that screen just darken and the, mm-hmm. the music dissipates, everything goes dark and you're, you know, it's the sphincter clenching moment of, fuck, something's going on here. And then you have other regions like, um, I think of Stranglethorn Vale, where, you know, if you've caught the boat over, you walk through Booty Bay, you walk out those front gates for the first time, and you're smack bang in the middle of this tropical jungle with that, um, music pumping. And it's just so different to everything else that you've seen up to that point. It is an eye-opening experience and a magical moment where that wave of immersion of this, you know, not only foreign land, but, you know, um, fictional land where you go, this is amazing. And uh, sadly, you know, I shed a tear as I say this, that'll never happen again. I, I mean, I do agree with you. I guess I'm lucky in that regard that, for instance, for me, what gives me that exact same feeling is walking out of the Furbolg tunnel into winter spring. And I still get like legit teary eyed whenever that happens or whenever I boot into Elwyn forest, especially if it's like dark and nighttime. Cause that is the first time I ever booted into Elwyn forest. It was nighttime. So every time I do that, I still get those feels. So in that sense, I guess I'm luckier and I hope I will never, never lose that. Mm. Um, Listener Jamie, who's obviously called into the show before, who's, um, you know, so great in getting involved with the community, just pointed out something that I'd love to run by you as well. And she sure. suggests that, you know, um, that's why people and herself included enjoy PvP in the game. You know, obviously we've got these quests that are static and I'm borrowing her words for this one. You know, quests are static, but battlegrounds and world PvP always have dynamic challenges. And just to extrapolate on what she's saying, Definitely every time you engage in PvP, whether it be world PvP or obviously if you go through a few battlegrounds for a few hours, you are electing to go into something where you don't know what's going to happen. There is no final resolve. It's not a quest chain where you know the scripted uh, acts that are going to happen. You don't know exactly every mob that's going to come along and how hard they're going to hit you and what you're going to do, blah, 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 blah. This is engaging with other players where everything is, you know, just up in the air. And do you find that you go away from the game, from the PvE um, style of the game, to do a few hours in PvP so that you get a little bit of that randomness back? Uh, I don't, primarily because um, the way I like to play games, so I'll give you an example from uh, the strategy game genre. So you've obviously got real-time strategy, something like StarCraft, which is fast-paced and there's no pause button, and you have something like Civilization, which is turn-based. I tend to like turn-based more purely because my reflexes are just crap. So I feel I can level the playing field by doing something that is not as fast-paced, and that's why I enjoy PvE. So even though the challenge is static, I always know that if I have 10 different classes with 10 different kits, there's always something I can tinker with and see how I can solve the challenge. And even if I solve the challenge 10 times on the same class exactly the, in a similar way, I get enjoyment out of doing uh, these actions, even if they're the same actions in a perfect uh, like execution. But when the game essentially doesn't even allow me to execute these actions, that's when I kind of get this Mm, you're you're not even allowing me to play the game or just in a very limited Hmm. Well, have you found any other examples? I'll obviously bring us all the way back to the start of, of what brought up the call. Have you found any other interesting examples within the game, within the PvE, um, you know, side of the game? Sorry, uh, within the PvE side of the game that you've worked out, like you say, the shortcuts or the best way to do it, the most effective tactics, all that jazz that have you know, very much so diminished the original experience? Yeah, so there's the, well, this this one's sort of mainly down to not uh, taking the quest text literally, so it's more humorous. But the second quest, uh, quest of the Sharp Beak uh, questline in Hinterlands tells you to go up to the altar of Zul and check out if Sharp Beak is there. So the previous two quests kind of 
conditioned you towards looking for cages and interacting with the cages to see if sharp beak was there. But this one actually just requires you to hop on your mount, uh, if you have a mount at that point already, and ride up on top of that ziggurat. And then once you're at the top, you've completed the quest. So you can just ignore all the normal mobs and the elite mobs at the top. You're done. And I didn't realize this the first couple of times I did that quest. So I was painstakingly, like, stakingly trying to move up the ziggurat, uh, killing all the mobs, avoiding respawns and everything. And then I get up top there and there's an elite mob staring in my face. And I'm like, oh crap, all that like effort was wasted because I need to go and find another player to do this. And then I moved a couple of steps further, like toward the center of the ziggurat and the quest is complete. And I'm like, okay, this is nice now, but definitely not... It's It was anticlimactic, sort of. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned there was one more quest that was probably a little bit better known um, that people have probably worked out how to do a little bit better as well. Which one was that? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's Harley, the concert to Malagas in Winter Spring, because she's part of an achievement to Onyxia, I think it is. Normally, what the quest tells you to do is to find this uh, teleport in the cave with all the elite blue dragons, but you can actually, like, walk up around the mountain and do a jump to her. There's, like, YouTube tutorials on how to do it and completely negate the entire dungeon crawl through the cave and do the teleport. Fantastic. And how many times would you say you've run through that quest? Uh, I actually only found out about that recently in Krona since I didn't do any, like I didn't even play during Vanilla and I don't plan on doing any raiding until Classic drops. It was just some guy in the guild needing help with that quest hmm. and we figured out that we could do it that way as well. Right. Now, through this talk, it's been pretty evident to me, you seem to know the quests pretty well in the game and you're rattling off a lot of stuff sort of off the cuff, which is very impressive. If I were to sort of Finish up the call by asking, and, and maybe if anything, we might even have to do another call with you sometime specifically on some of the greatest quests in the game or some of the worst if you're up for it. But, sure, um, yeah. you know, if I would just put you on the spot now and say, if you were to pick one, cause obviously you've done, you know, a lot of the quests in the game many, many times. But if I were to say pick one that you know you have done a million times that you are almost sick of that but still stands out so high in your mind of like, oh, God, I'm going to play Classic and this quest is coming, which one would you nominate? Oh, I mean, that is tough. But if you're putting me on the spot like, like this, uh, I'm very standard in this that I'm just looking forward to the missing diplomat quest. Yeah. Definitely. And I, mean, I I actually, I'm in the middle of that quest chain at the moment on the server that I'm playing on. And I haven't done this quest chain in a very long time. And I- uh, if you get stuck at the end, there's a, I could tell you how to do the Ed guy really easily as well. Oh, okay. There's a bit of a way to cheese that one as well, is there? Yes. Right. Is which, that- is, which is funny because the guy preceding that one actually has a way uh, that particular cheese doesn't work Mm. so for me from a programming standpoint it was funny that they implemented that in there but then in the end boss of that quest chain the manner in which you could cheese him was possible okay the end wasn't it was the end in dust wallow marsh because that's where i'm at at the moment oh is that the end of it yes yes it's with private handel yeah that's I I attempted that for the first time like two nights ago and got my ass handed to me when like the three or four mobs spawn at the camp and I was just like ah oh, fuck um uh, yeah yeah is that is that the uh, is do that... what you normally do if you get jumped by several mobs and you'll be fine yeah which is what I normally do when I get jumped by several mobs is shit my pants you so should, I just did that yeah <laughs> yeah okay but you can you can just run back. Uh, keeping like put a dot or whatever you have on handle so he keeps getting constant damage so he won't disengage but all the other guys will disengage at some point and then you're just one on one with handle fair enough all right well mate thanks so much for that we'll have to do that quest call sometime please do keep on me about that that would be a great call yes i do that fantastic all right mate thanks so much for calling in today no worries thank you 
And that's it for the calls today, everyone. But just before we go, I want to get one more quick shout out into listener McCoyta, who says this. Hi, Josh. I've been listening to the podcast for the last few weeks now and have really been enjoying the law segments and how in depth you go to understand characters and areas. I just wanted to say thanks for putting in all this hard work and time into the podcast for us to enjoy. I'm planning on streaming my first ever vanilla experience of WoW, besides a little light unofficial server stuff, as well as running a guild. If it isn't too much trouble, do you mind giving me a shout out at www.splintertreepost.com? And I'm absolutely happy to, McCoyta. So everyone head on over to splintertreepost.com if you'd like to say hi to McCoyta and check out what's going on over there classic-wise. But that's the show for today, everyone. So be sure to tune in next week as we have even more calls for you. So there's more Kevin Jordan, more calls, and more countdown coming very soon. But before we go, let's get through the thank yous and a big thank you as always to the following patrons Aero PC, Anti, Binger, Brandon K, Callum F, Chunky Dunk, Connor C, Damian A, Dave K, David F, DJ M, Herbert, James S, Jamie S, John H C, Josh W, Minoru, Randall H, Rasmus S, Rarebit, Rick S, <sighs> Ryan K, Schmige, Sylvia K, Tim B, Tim S, Torbjorn C, Voikora, and Zudamos. One of these days I'll get through it all in one breath, but thank you so much to all those people. And of course, the very dedicated patrons of Countdown to Classic, an extra special shout out and thank you from the bottom of my heart too. Alice R, Billy C, Daniel K, Eddie S, Eric S, Fire Spit and Kitten, Flozy B, Ida B, Bat Lord, Carl W, Nick B, Palpurus, Tsunami, The Anton, Wilson Ma, and Velarco. Thank you so much for your phenomenal support of the show. Countdown to Classic would not be the same or would not be here without your support. So that's it for today. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. I'll see you all next time.